Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening. It's my pleasure to call to order the 515 City Council meeting of June 2nd, 2021. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Council Member or Vice Mayor Weir. Here. Council Member Arias. Here. Council Member Gonzalez. Here. Council Member Smith. I am here. Council Member Freeman. Here. Council Member Gray. Here. And Council Member Parlier. Here. Thank you. On March 4th, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency in California due to the threat of COVID-19. The governor also passed several executive orders, including the suspension of some components of the Brown Act related to meetings such as this. Therefore, seating in the council chamber is limited. And as such, Council Member Parlier is participating by phone. All council votes tonight will be conducted by roll call. And at this time, Councilmember Gonzalez will offer the invocation. Following the invocation, Councilmember Freeman will lead us in the pledge. Would you please stand? Eternal God, we thank you for bringing us here today to do the people's work. We ask that as we conduct business tonight that you be with us in our presence uh, and to guide us and give us wisdom and allow us to lead with grace, uh, with mercy, with justice, and with wisdom. Uh, we ask that you bless all those who are still uh, living with many trials and tribulations during this global pandemic. And we ask that as we move out of this pandemic, that we become a much more vibrant, much safer, and a far more just community. We ask this in your name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. We need to get this... And we'll wait until everyone is ready to go. Well, thank you all for being here and engaging in the civic process. Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly. We request that you turn off your phones. Please be courteous in the use of cameras and videos. And for safety reasons and as a courtesy to others, no signs are allowed in the council chamber or in the lobby. Applause is allowed only during the presentations portion of the meeting, but not during other portions of the meeting. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting. Madam Clerk, would you please read the first item? Under presentations, item 4A, a proclama proclamation to Zane Smith, Executive Director of the Boys and Girls Club of Kern County, declaring National Boys and Girls Club Week during the week of June 21st, 2021 in Bakersfield. When I think about the Boys and Girls Club, I think about caring people for the future generations, and it is always an honor in the city of Bakersfield to see the Boys and Girls Club represented everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And we have leaders of the club that really care about those boys and girls. And then we have boys and girls who are now beginning to change the future because of what they've learned. Over 40 sites. And so it is my honor today to be able to read this proclamation. 
Whereas the young people of Bakersfield are tomorrow's leaders, and many young people need professional youth services to guide them to reach their full potential. And whereas 49 club sites throughout Bakersfield and Kern County provide services to almost 7,000 young people daily, and whereas boys and girls clubs in our city help to ensure that our young people are occupied by offering them a safe, and supportive refuge, one that provides quality programs, and where as Boys and Girls Clubs of Kern County will celebrate National Boys and Girls Club Week along with 4,000 clubs and more than 4 million young people nationwide. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim June 21st through June 25th as National Boys and Girls Club Week in our city and call on all of our citizens to recognize the Boys and Girls Clubs of Kern County for providing comprehensive and effective services to our young people and to our community. And it's dated the second day of June. It is my honor today to be able to present this to the president of the Boys and Girls Club, Kristen Monsabias. She's joined here with Larry Coleman, who's a board member, and Zane Smith, the executive director. Ms. Monsabias, thank you. It's an honor, and we'd love you to offer some comments. Whoever is going to. Zane's prepared for this. Zane is prepared. Never give Zane a mic. Oh, gosh. Uh, Kristen was generous enough to, to share her time with us, and so I appreciate uh, Kristen and Larry joining me um, at the podium. Um, the, the honor of serving our children um, is, is tremendous with our Boys and Girls Club. We are celebrating 55 years this summer of being in the community. Our hearts and our doors are open. Oh, sorry, guys. Thanks to the leadership and the community support. I'm clumsy. Thanks to the leadership and the community support um, of Bakersfield. And we continue to grow, we continue to expand, and we continue to cherish the opportunity to be of service um, to everyone here in Kern County so, and the city of Bakersfield. Thank you for this opportunity. We appreciate it. We celebrate. Thank you. We celebrate with you. However, we're going to celebrate. Oh, and okay. let's take a photo together. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Take a photo together. And this will be great. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public statements. Thank you. This meeting has limited public access. Therefore, public comments were encouraged to be made to the city clerk through email or by phone call. If you're here in person to make a public statement, please fill out a speaker card, give it to the city clerk. All statements are given a three-minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk. She'll give copies to the council. And if you're to speak after, if you are here to speak, on hearing items 10A through 10D, we ask that you speak after staff's presentation on those matters. We're very interested and concerned with your issues. However, due to the public notice requirement of the Brown Act, the council can't take action when an item isn't on the agenda. The council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting, such as repetitive statements, going off topic, shouting, surpassing the three-minute time limit. Also, I just want to remind you that due to fire regulations, that we can't have people standing in the back, and we'll need to uh, stop the meeting if that's the case, and just make sure that people are safe. So thank you, Madam Clerk. Do we have any public speakers today? Mayor Go, we've received uh, 21 speaker cards this evening, six regarding e-bikes, three regarding community police, two regarding redistricting, six regarding Measure N, five regarding separate subjects. 
Thank you. And as a reminder, all statements are given a three-minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. We appreciate your input very much. Madam Clerk, please call the first public speaker. Mayor Go, I'm going to call all of the speakers regarding the e-bikes item, if they could please um, line up uh, in front of the microphone. First speaker, Mickey Rivers. Next, Marcy Cunningham. Third will be Donna Schilling. Followed by Monica Tudor. Cassandra Wernhart and Marion Vargas. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Okay, I am Mickey Rivers, and I am here today in reference to not allowing e-bikes or any type of motorized vehicle on the equestrian trails. I am retired and enjoy riding my horse for relaxation, peace of mind. Local horse trails were established long ago. Designated horse trails, primarily on dirt, are mostly separated from paved bike trails, and motorized traffic is not allowed. Many of the trails go through the Panama Vista Preserve, where many community volunteers have been working hard to restore native plants and animal life. E-bikes or any type of motorized vehicles would be destructive to this area. Safety is considered as being number one priority. Horses are large and powerful, but they're considered a flight animal when spooked. Can you imagine just riding along, enjoying the peace and quiet and the surrounding beauty of nature, all of a sudden when you have an e-bike, which can go anywhere from 20 to 40 miles an hour, approach you or your horse behind you, in front of you, or even from the side. These motorized e-bikes can cause horses to spook, rear, buck, or bolt, throwing the rider to the ground which in turn could result in serious injuries to the ride or the horse. There are people of all ages and families who ride the equestrian trails. You have to picture in your mind the injuries, especially to your child, your grandchild, or any child, or your mom or dad, or any older person that could happen. Being on the trail, you cannot get an ambulance there due to the terrain. So in this case, it's a life-threatening situation. This is just a prime example of not allowing e-bikes or any motorized vehicles on the equestrian trails. Thank you for taking the time to listen to a very important topic. Thank you, Ms. Rivers. Next speaker, please. My name is Marcy Cunningham. Please prohibit e-bikes on the hiking and equestrian trails throughout the parkway, which includes public and private trails on the north and south sides of the river. The parkway trails are one of the main destinations for equestrians in Bakersfield. Whether they park at Enos Lane, Era Park, Panorama Vista Preserve, Hart Park, or one of the private stables on the river, these trails are well used by equestrians from all over Bakersfield. Horses and motorized vehicles don't mix, which is why motorcycles were banned from the river over 30 years ago. Last Saturday, I encountered three teenagers riding dirt bikes on the south side of the Carrier Canal below the Panorama Bluffs. I heard them coming up behind me from the west, turned my horse, and asked them to stop and cut their engines, which they did. I explained that motorcycles were not allowed in the area and that they needed to leave. I told them that they could be fined and lose their bikes if cited by the police. And their reply was that they didn't know it was illegal, but that they can't get in trouble if they can't be caught. They took off to the east joined up with a paved bike trail. One bike threw up a rooster tail of dirt as he was leaving, which frightened my horse. The same scenario could happen with an e-bike, and it would not be illegal, and I would not be able to confront and educate the riders. Regardless of the state definition of e-bikes, they are motorized. Keep e-bikes on pavement and off dirt trails for everyone's safety. We need language that specifically prohibits e-bikes from dirt trails 
in any proposed ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Donna Schilling. I'm the trails manager for the Panorama Vista Preserve. Ms. Schilling, would you lower the mic a little, please? Put it down? Yes, thank you. Okay. Horses, e-bikes, horses and e-bikes. Yikes, what a combination. Like gasoline and matches. For weeks you have been listening to equestrians beg for understanding and support. Don't take our trails away is a cry we hear far and wide. Don't destroy the Kern River Parkway or the plants and wildlife habitat that we have all worked so hard to protect over the years. The city of Bakersfield is comprised of approximately 151 square miles of ground, according to my Google friend. 151 square miles. Kern County is comprised of about 8,000 square miles. That's a lot of land certainly enough to accommodate both equestrians and e-bikes with no crossovers. This is a huge undertaking, and the first step to a mutual solution is to realize that, that it all must begin with you and us, the equestrians, and the cyclists. You have heard our voices. We have not heard your voices or the, or the voices of the cyclists. Don't you think it's time to reunite? To reunite? Don't you all think it's time to unite? We can build a bridge between your hearts and ours. If we stand together, we can come together mutually to a ben to beneficial solution, to a mutually beneficial solution, one that each of us can live with. Equestrians don't want to harm cyclists. Cyclists don't want to harm equestrians. But 151 square miles of ground, there has to be a workable compromise staring us right in the face. The decisions you make will have a direct impact on hundreds of people. Please don't rush to a decision. We must work together to get it right. We are Bakersfield. Let us figure this out together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schilling. Oh, Next speaker, I'm please. sorry. I have brought my cards. Oh, go I ahead and give I would like to invite to every one of you clerk. individually Just to, give them to the come and meet clerk. me and my horse. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, my name is Monica Tudor, and uh, like the other ladies before me, I am here to ask that you prohibit the motorized bicycles on the equestrian trails. Um, a lot of us have worked and put in a lot of hours to maintain these trails, to plant the things, to take out the tumbleweeds. My three main concerns are the, the animal, the wildlife that's there, there's, it's, and I consider the trails and the Panorama Vista Preserve a gem of Bakersfield, and I am not interested in keeping it all to myself. It is something that is just gorgeous, and I encourage everybody to go out there. But horses and e-bikes and motorcycles don't mix. It can be something as, as quiet as a, a dog coming up behind a horse causing it to spook. That happened to me, I came off, I wind up with a bruise from here to there. Not a good deal. And when you're talking about kids use these trails, old ladies older than me use these trails. So the, the animals are out there. We've got egrets and sometimes owls, sometimes bobcats. Just, it's just gorgeous out there. We've got the plant life that has been uh, revegetated so that it'll look like it, it did before the oil fields and the cotton fields came out. And again, it's gorgeous out there. And like I said, the safety issue is something. Um, I am concerned that the riders of the e-bikes don't understand that a horse is like 900 to 1,200 pounds in some cases. You got a little person riding an e-bike. What happens when they too, when they meet unexpectedly? It's not gonna be a pretty sight. When you've got hikers on the trails, you can see each other from far away, you can, you know, adjust, either the hikers go off the trail or I'll go off the trail, depending on what's happening. But the e-bikes go zipping around like crazy. They're in my neighborhood, they don't wear helmets, they don't look for other cars. I'm really concerned that when some of these little kids go out there, I mean, what a great idea. You toss your kids out on the preserve, let them ride their e-bikes. What harm can come to them? A lot. And so I'm just asking you guys to please be careful when you draft your proposal or draft whatever the proper word is so that 
the e-bikes stay on the paved trails and they're not allowed to be anywhere else. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Tudor. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Cassandra Warnhart, and I'm here to speak about the e-bikes. My daughter and I have been riding together for years. I've seen a lot of accidents happen with horses spooking. Um, we don't have the pleasure of having our horses in the backyard. We don't have the pleasure of having a horse trailer to trailer our horse somewhere else to ride. Where we ride is on those trails where we board our horse. Um, thinking about your, think about your grandkids, your kids, they're out there on an e-bike, right? Um, riding, and they collide with a horse. Or they're on a horse, and they collide. It's not gonna be pretty. Someone's gonna get hurt. Hopefully no one dies, because these are huge animals, and they feel like something's gonna attack them. You know, they're a flight animal. They're gonna take off. If that e-bike hits that horse, and that horse lands on the rider, on both ways, someone's gonna get hurt. And if you guys pass this, that then, you know, you guys are saying it's okay for that to happen because we have nowhere else to go except where we board our horse. So I'm asking you guys, please consider us out there. We have nowhere else to go. They've got a lot of places they can go. They can't ride their e-bikes, you know, down the main street. I mean, could you imagine us going down Chester on horses and just, <laughs> you know, where regular cars go? Um, so I'm asking you guys, please, to consider this and not to have them go on our trails. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Warnhart. Next speaker, please. Good evening. Um, my name is Marion Vargas. Uh, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. City attorney staff was directed by your legislative and litigation committee to write an amendment to city code to allow e-bikes on the Kern River Parkway bike trail where motorized vehicles are prohibited. We have tried to establish that introducing e-bikes to the trail system presents considerable hazards Concerned citizens have told you about the inherent dangers of mixing motorized bikes on trails with horses and hikers, and have expressed concerns about the harmful impact to natural habitat, wildlife, and personal property in one of our most valuable natural and recreational resources, the Kern River Parkway. Allowing motorized e-bikes on bike trails most certainly opens the door to their going off pavement onto dirt, equestrian, and hiking trails. As one e-bike enthusiast told me, we should be able to go anywhere we want. If the proposed ordinance allows e-bikes on the bike trail, but does not include specific prohibitions against e-bikes going off pavement to hiking and equestrian trails, if there is no codified or codified penalty for violation and no described and funded education and enforcement plan, then to keep the trail safe for all users, the city council should reject the ordinance change until these important issues are addressed. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Vargas. Mm -hmm. And now, Madam Clerk, the next group of speakers, please. Mayor Go, the next three speakers will be speaking regarding community police. I will call your name in order. Please come to the podium and make your comments. The first speaker, Christina Crompton. The second speaker, Isaiah Crompton. And the final speaker, Pastor Jordan. Ms. Crompton, are you outside? There you are. Okay. Ms. Crompton, you're first. Uh, Pastor and Isaiah, if you'd like to sit in the front, uh, there's some seats there too.
How are you guys doing today? My name is Christina Crompton. Um, I'm from the east side of Bakersfield. Um, there is a difference in things in the community that are being out there. For instance, I have my own personal police experience that I've, you know, encountered with. My two youngest children were killed by a drunk driver a day after Thanksgiving. Okay, if I feel like if it was another race, the man would have got life. But it wasn't. He got 10 years for manslaughter, for killing a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Then got two more years for their dad. So that's, four, what, 12 years? Then two more years for my two-year-old. And then another year for my six-year-old at the time. And she had to witness her brother and sisters getting CPR on the side of the road and their dad burning in the fiery car. And then the way they contacted me, you need to come down and identify your children's bodies. You know, there's different ways that you approach people in the community and that you can tell them without telling them and freaking them out and hurting themselves and harming themselves and or harming anyone else in the community around you in these circumstances. You know, it's a different way of speaking and communicating with them. Instead of having so much brutality, instead of, you know, being so rah-rah on people, maybe you should just you know, calmly have a different advocate come up and speak with them. Like, first, try to de-escalate the situation. I would appreciate that, you know? Put the funding somewhere where it can be utilized, like parks. There's one park that I take my kids to all the time. I go out there, I pick up the trash in the park. I pick up the needles out there park. And like, sometimes the toys are too hot and they're too old and guess what, they break and no one has fixed it. No one thought about fixing it. Nobody thought about fixing the issue that was happening at that time. We're still chasing bums out the bathroom. We're still having police come around harassing us as a community. I don't have no harm against no police. I'm not against them. But at the same time, I am against the way they treat our people, and I think that it deserves respect. You know, respect is given where it is. I'm from the projects, and guess what? I feel like just because I'm from the projects doesn't make me any different from you sitting up there. No, does it make me any different from a man in a suit? I can wear a suit too. Because when you go and see your natural clothes, guess what? You're still human. And that's my, my view. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crompton. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hello, Mayor. Ward one council person and the rest of the council and the lawyers and the um, attorneys. My name is Isaiah Crompton. I'm here to support my niece. She's been through a lot. Um, also to talk about uh, community policing. I think that um, our neighborhoods need a strong community policing and I think it should be made up of of guys like me and Pastor Jordan uh, Christine others that are in the community that know the people and uh, I don't, I don't the, the word defunding is not that for, for much as I know about it I don't like it the way it sounds but I, I work with Pastor Jordan for over 15 20 years in the community, we started a Stop the Violence movement. We also do, do the uh, Martin Luther King Day celebration, and we do it from our hearts and from our pockets. You know, we care about the community. We'd like to see more going on over in the Southeast community, uh, over in the Lakeview Quarter, or what we call now the MLK uh, uh, Boulevard. We'd like to see more things happening. We're talking to our council person and to the mayor. We're trying to get some things going. Uh, we're going to keep moving in that direction. But I think there should be more community policing. Uh, there needs to be places where if a child is going through some trauma or ready to start getting a gang and his mom doesn't know what to do, there should be a place where she could take that child. 
that should be, uh, be, be set for jail. When a child, a person, a teenager see itself going down the wrong path, where do you take them? You know, there should be some places for that. And uh, there should be some faces there that they're familiar with that they can relate to. Anyway, um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Compton. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor, Council evening. Members. My name is Pastor Jehoshaphat Jordan. I pastor a local church on 19th and Robinson. I've been in this community fighting to alleviate some of the gang violence for the last 25 years. I'm not educated enough to remember all the stats, but I do know that crime has gone up in the last five years, way beyond where it used to be. So the idea of defunding the police just don't, comp I don't comprehend that, I don't understand. I, from my view, I think we need more policing. I'm not here to defend the policemen. I'm not here to criticize the policemen. I do think that we need some type of police reform because policemen are just like pastors and preachers. There's no special place to get them from. As a pastor, the pastor name, the name does not make me a man. The man make the pastor. Policeman is a title. The man makes the policeman, not the title. So I'd like to see some policemen's reform, but to defund the police when we have areas of our community that are not patrolled regularly, where we have crime running rampant, homicides, gang violence is up over 35% this year as opposed to last year. So why are we considering defunding the police? As a local community person that have been in this community, I think we need more policemen. How are we going to solve the crimes that we're having right now if we defund the police department? I want to thank you for your time. I ask that you consider my, my thoughts and my prayers are with you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jordan. Councilmember Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to make a comment. Pastor, uh, thank you so much for your comments today. And Mr. Crompton and Ms. Uh, Crompton, thank you so much. Um, I just also want to give you public credit for all the work you've done in the community, both of you gentlemen, for years. I was had a, a fortunate opportunity to witness your leadership when I came home from school in 2006 and see you start up uh, Stop the Violence. And you've been in the neighborhoods year after year, uh, season after season, um, working hard, building relationships in the, with, with people. Um, and I, I admire that and I appreciate you and your leadership for being, I mean, authentic leaders. And um, I, I take your word seriously. Pastor, I represent your, your church. Your church is in Ward 2 and it's an honor to, to partner with you and to be of service. So thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Gonzalez. And next speaker, please. Mayor Go, the next two speakers will be speaking regarding redistricting. Lori Pesante and Emma De La Rosa. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Good evening, my name is Lori Passante, and I live in Mr. Freeman's ward. Good evening. I am the director of civic engagement for the Dolores Huerta Foundation. And I'm here tonight to raise the theme of redistricting. For those who don't know what redistricting is, it's a process we go through every 10 years where after we do the census count, we have to figure out how the maps are gonna be drawn for each of the wards in the city of Bakersfield. And I went on your website today and I saw that there was a website. Um, the link uh, for the Spanish version was written in English, so you might want to take a look at that. Um, and I did find a, a memo about the process for redistricting. I encourage everybody to read that memo. Um, it was dated March 11th. 
Um, and so I know it's been on the radar in some, you know, nooks and crannies of the city of Bakersfield, but I haven't seen any calls for public participation. And in fact, that's my job this year is to work with folks about public participation. And indeed, the process memo talks about how the city of Bakersfield under the Fair Maps Act is required to engage with the public in good faith. And uh, I'm not so sure if we don't have any hearings set yet. And um, uh, Kern County had a kickoff meeting. They had a presentation. They informed the public about what redistricting is and why it's so important for choosing leaders that represent the community fairly, equitably, right? For all those important decisions that you guys are making. Um, and so I would ask uh, this council if perhaps on your next available opportunity to put it on your agenda, if you would please uh, provide the public with a presentation about redistricting and how the city of Bakersfield is gonna engage authentically with the public, uh, certainly starting with some links to the redistricting information in uh, Punjabi and Spanish and the other languages that we serve. I would also ask that um, if you need any help, I've been doing this for a while now. I've been out in the food banks, out in the clinics, out in the neighborhoods. We've been knocking on doors. I've taught a lot of people about redistricting. I think ultimately I'm a teacher at heart. So uh, that's how I got my start at least. I would love very much to talk to anybody anytime about this process because I want everybody to get involved because what we do this year is gonna impact the city of Bakersfield for the next decade, the next decade. And so please reach out to me. I, I want to be of service to you and to our community. I also stand in solidarity with our folks who are speaking out about equitable funding allocations for so they can feel safe and truly authentically be safe in our community. So I stand in solidarity with them. And I'm, with that, I'll, I'll close it up. And thank you for your time and hand over my cards for anybody who would like to contact me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Pizzanti. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Ms. Gennaro, uh, can you clarify for the council and the public? I believe this is still in legend lit. Can you just give us the timeline for the public? Certainly, um, and thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Uh, our office has prepared a PowerPoint, and that was scheduled to go to the legend lit committee, I believe, uh, not only at the last meeting, but the one before. And as you know, the chair of that committee is uh, is out on medical leave right now, and so we have not reset it, but I am certainly amenable to bringing that PowerPoint back to the council as a whole if that's something that the council would like to direct me to do and get the process started. I, I think considering um, the fact that our chair is out, that perhaps we should bring it back, so I'd like to make that referral tonight if it's... Um, if it's amenable to my colleagues. I don't hear any objections. I'm assuming so. so I'll, I'll yeah. just go ahead and bring it back. I'll, I'll work with the city manager and bring it back as, as a report. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Emma De La Rosa, Policy Advocate with Leadership Council. I just wanted to um, reiterate what Lori just mentioned. Um, about uh, pu publishing all of the plans for the redistricting process for 2021, making sure that that's all included on the website, that it's easily accessible to the public um, in languages most understood by the communities, and also asking that those hearings and those public meetings are also accessible to community members. We wanna make sure that they're not held during work hours or too late at night, and also maybe provide a virtual um, option for folks who still may wanna um, engage from their home. And um, same as um, the Lourdes Huerta Foundation Leadership Council it welcomes the opportunity to work with y'all um, to support in the redistricting process. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Della Rosa. Next speaker, please. Madam Clerk. Mayor, the following six speakers will be speaking regarding Measure N. Emily Boone, Jared Hogg, Martin Higuera, Riddy Patel, Cass Shepard, and Maria Rios. Just give it a minute for everybody to enter.
Welcome. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. My name is Emily Boone, and I reside in Ward 5. Um, I am willing to listen, but uh, this is a quote of Christian Clegg. City managers bridge the gap between politics and administration. They serve as the chief executive of city government and typically oversee all city staff as we carry out, uh, as they carry out the council's laws and communicate decisions. I'm willing to listen, but. And, uh, hello, this is Bob Smith, city council member of Ward 4. Please leave a message. A city council is a group of uh, elected officials, uh, as you all know, uh, known as a board. Um, they are tasked with representing um, the interests of its community members, uh, which I am a part of. Uh, poor communica communication among local government limits uh, participatory budgeting, which is something that is very important when deciding where and how to allocate funds regarding Measure N. Uh, Measure N is dedicated to public safety, uh, which uh, there is no correlation, which more police, which is over 40% of the Measure N funds are going towards, actually do uh, uh, increase public safety. Uh, collaboration with community members uh, can look like things like accessibility, um, you know, uh, live streaming meetings, um, having a space large enough to accommodate, um, although understandable um, with COVID restrictions, um, hoping to see since some of these will be lifting soon uh, that we will adhere by that. Um, promotion in various platforms, um, not just social media, um, really involving the community members um, is uh, quite interesting that that seems like a radical idea when it is in fact the community members money. Um, uh, even um, the way this room is set up, um, the way my experience has gone with communicating with members, um, I have spoken with a few of you. Um, however, uh, the general consensus tends to be the same um, quote as Christian Clegg is, I'm willing to listen, but. Um, no services uh, for a human representing a mental health crisis, um, which we saw, I saw at last city council meeting uh, while the police um, chuckled outside um, and is also a representation of why we need um, measure end funds allocated to true public safety. Um, I want to see um, why are you afraid of um, confronting your privilege, uh, the work, um, how you'll be perceived. Uh, you don't believe in your community to make these decisions. Ms. Boone, your time is up. Um, we demand Ms. more, Boone. and I'm asking you to participate. Thank you, Ms. Boone. Next speaker, please. That would be Jared. I cede, I cede my time to the next speaker. Madam Clerk, just call the next speaker, please. Martin Higuera. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Martin Higuera. I am a 17-year-old high school student in Bakersfield. And as you all know, Measure N was a bipartisan attempt to raise additional funds for public safety in our city and a survey of several thousands of people who live in Bakersfield showed that the community members had seven key areas where they wanted funding to go instead of the police, which were racial equity, p policies and plans, youth development and education services, public health, including mental health, affordable housing and homeless services, building black economic equity, violence prevention that doesn't include cops, and city reparations to black and indigenous communities. But instead, you all decided it was a good idea to allocate over half of the 56 million that Measure In raised in additional funding to the police. Okay. And what has happened since then? You all know. 
A report that y'all released showed that crime rates have only generally increased since you all started throwing millions of our taxpayer dollars to the police. You're just throwing this funding away. Your goal was to bring crime rates down. The opposite has happened. Obviously, your solutions are not working. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Higuera. Next speaker, please. Madam Clerk. Riddhi Patel, followed by Cass Shepard and Maria Rios. Sorry. My name is Riddhi. You guys, I don't like any one of you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what it actually means to defund the police because it's clearly all of you, all of you are incompetent. The community members who spoke before me have done the work. They've been here in the community longer than you have. They've been doing the work longer than you have. And they understand the need, as they said, for community policing, which is something even People's Budget Bakersfield has advocated for. They say violence prevention. That means reimagining public safety. And that means not believing in the police to solve all of our solution. And that means actually supporting community policing. And defunding the police, as even chief of Bakersfield Police Department, Greg Terry said, the police are not here to address the root issues of crime. That's not what they're here for. They're here as a reactionary method. And Karen, as you said, that we need to look at studies that actually show how to address the root issues of crime. Okay, so once again, it means reimagining public safety. The police are not gonna give us housing. They're not gonna give us food. They're not gonna give us education. They're not gonna give us more jobs and not adding more police. That doesn't mean job creation. That's not how this works. They should not, you should not be paying citizens to criminalize black and brown people. That's not what our community should be doing. So you guys understand that defunding the police is not actually like some radical thing. It's been happening for decades before last year. People have been calling for what actually addresses the root issues of crime, like investing in housing, education, et cetera. So don't act like stupid. Like you guys act stupid all the time. Like you guys know what this is. And you guys like use fear mongering and all of these things to perpetuate an idea that doesn't actually exist. And specifically, as you all know, that the first step to defunding the police is a participatory budgeting process. A participatory budgeting process is one thing. It is not what you choose to believe it is. It's not when I slap bumper sticker on a truck and call it a four-door sedan. That's not it. A four, uh, participatory budgeting process is not whatever you wanted to believe of like, oh, this is what I thought it was, so this is not participatory budgeting process. A participatory budgeting process includes a steering committee. It includes that steering committee having power over real money in this city and where to designate that money. So this, this like survey, email me your thoughts, that's not a participatory budgeting process. And every single one of the community members in your wards would say that I would like to have a say in where my taxpayer money goes. So do your job because this is annoying. Thank you, Ms. Patel. Next speaker, please. Hello, um, I would just like to echo everything. Uh, would you please state your name for the record? Oh, hi, my name is Cass, Cassidy Shepard. Um, I would like to just echo everything that um, everyone has just said. Um, when I was here for the last city council meeting, um, I witnessed a police officer who has murdered someone laugh when someone in here mentioned that murder. Um, I also watched a police officer roll his eyes as someone stood here and listed the people who have signed for the People's Budget Baco. They clearly do not care. They clearly are a public health hazard. I watch them stand around with their masks off all the time. I've seen the same thing with Kern County Shares. They are a public health hazard. They do not care. And it is time that our community decides to actually invest in preventing crime and supporting black and brown communities that have been harmed by police violence. Measure N was supposed to go towards public safety, but all it has done is go spent more money on police, which is not keeping us safer. As someone already mentioned, our crime has increased, so clearly it's not working, and clearly we need to do something else. Um, so I would like Measure N funding to go to actual public safety measures, such as 
investing in education, de-escalation training, um, investing in homelessness services, drug prevention. There are so many things that we could be doing that would actually help our community and stop crime from happening. And all we are doing currently is increasing violence in the community and it needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shepard. Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Maria Rios. Hi, good evening. My name is Myra Rios and I live in Ward 4. I'm here to speak in support of People's Budget Bakersfield and the seven asks that have been put together with community input. I would like to highlight tonight specifically an ask that's called City Racial Equity Policies and Plans, which includes participatory budgeting, which you've heard some about tonight. It calls for a process that is accessible, clear, and direct, um, and where the community has a say and where funds are allocated. This process has been happening in our communities, thanks to People's Budget Bakersfield. Um, this is the way that they've put these asks together. It's a process that can be achieved if it becomes a priority to all of you, because you are in charge of the decisions here in the city. Um, and it is a priority for the community. The community would like to have a say. This process also requires community accountability. It requires that council members be um, available and be able to meet with people in their wards to hear about their uh, priorities and what their needs are in their communities. This ask specifically also includes investment in black-centered programs, which are crucial to centering the voices of black residents and residents most impacted to make sure that they're represented at the table as well. All of this, though, requires that our elective officials be accessible and within reach to have these important conversations about community priorities and that you choose to be champions for these priorities. Um, People's Budget Baco um, has been able to talk to a few people on the council about budget priorities and um, about participatory budgeting, but the majority of the council has not taken the opportunity uh, to meet with and learn from the people that are already doing this work. So I encourage you to um, accept that invitation and have conversations with your community members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rio. R Ris sorry, Ms. Rios. Next speaker, please, Madam Clerk. Mayor Go, the next five speakers will be speaking regarding separate subjects. The first speaker this evening, Curtis Bingham, followed by Troy Hightower, Marcus Crompton, Jeffrey Anthony, Welcome. I respect the Lord. <clears throat> My name is Curtis Jane Bingham Sr., street evangelist for our Lord and Savior, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who truly is the only begotten Son of our Holy Heavenly Father, God Almighty. And to you, Honorable Mayor, our First Lady, and to the board, I just pray the Lord bless you guys for what you're doing. You got to remember what the Lord got you here for. You're here to do things for us in the public. You're doing a wonderful work out there. Bakersfield is a beautiful city. We're going, and the Lord would have you guys remember who you are. You are leaders. So you know how to make these decisions the right way, the way you see fit to keep us going. See, there's a lot of things that are taking place now, and the Lord would have us to remember before anybody here was born. He said it's going to get worse and worse, Book of Timothy, before any of us was born, and it is. Law enforcement will never be your problem. It's the people. See, they the one got to get out and catch the people. And they doing evil in so many different brackets, you can't even count. So when people come and have things to say, the Lord would have you just maintain, relax yourself. He gave you the leadership. You know what you're doing. We respect what you're doing. You're doing a very good job. You know, this the people. It's the people all over the world that's designed to do evil. And this is why Lord and Savior said, some ain't coming to heaven. Saying, if God Almighty can say that, well, you should see just exactly what's What's t taking place down here, it really shouldn't be a surprise at what's taking place. This evil is running everywhere, but it was written before we were born. Law enforcement are restrainers. The Bible said the Antichrist can't come into power unless the restrainer is taken out of the way. The strainer would be the Holy Spirit, and God is using law enforcement to help us now. If it wasn't for them now, we could, could not do anything now. 
We have to do our best to honor and respect law enforcement to the highest. See, people talk, but there's so many crimes in so many different areas that they're fighting for us to keep us able to live. We have to recognize who they are. The Lord vouched for them, saying they his ministers. And we got to do everything we can to uplift them. And God Almighty, Jesus Christ, put you guys in charge. And this money that they're talking about, they better remember. And they don't want to get this one. It was law enforcement that got major in past. See, people don't want to get that. But I was here in the beginning. A lot of these groups weren't even here. I wish a lot of these groups would just wait. There's going to be money next year. See, get your own money and leave law enforcement money alone. They need every penny they can get because the criminals got more than them. See, they don't think about that. They think all the money finna just go, 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 go. Hold on. It's going to be something next year. Get your own money and leave law enforcement money the way because everything we see we building won't happen if we don't have law enforcement out there protecting it so we can keep going. It is evil running out there. Ever since, since the last time I've been here, what day was it not a murder or shooting? That's not law enforcement's problem. It's the people that's choosing to do the evil. And that's why the Lord tell us what he tell us. Some come into heaven and some not. So you guys stay on top doing like you're doing. You are leaders, and you're doing a good job. And those that don't understand, they just going to have to learn to get things Thank separate. Thank you, Mr. Bingham. Row for themselves. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Honorable Bingham. Mayor. And to the Honorable Board, and that's the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Troy Hightower. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Go, Council Member, City Manager. My name is Troy Hightower. I'm a local um, economic community development consultant that really uh, tries to focus on the disadvantaged communities. I'm following up on comments that were made at the April 26th Measure and Oversight meeting, where we announced that we have two potential TCC projects an active transportation project on 4th Street and a downtown electric circulator bus. Since submitting those projects, we were approached by community leaders to assist them in the development of a new affordable housing project on 4th Street. It has come to our attention that all these proposed projects are eligible for and could be funded by Measure In Economic Development Funds. Measure in is not limited to police investments only. The projects would also be eligible for Economic Opportunity Area, or EOA, funding under their improved pedestrian connectivity, sidewalks, complete streets, and a recent study uh, that we presented at that Oversight Committee meeting showed that Bakersfield ranked number two in the nation for pedestrian fatality rates. The, re the report was discussed in a recent TV interview among representatives from that study, um, from Caltrans, <clears throat> excuse me, from Kerncog, and Councilmember Bob Smith was in that one. We respectfully ask the Council to support our request to use Measure N and other sources of funding, such as TCC and EOA, to fund the proposed projects all of which are in disadvantaged communities, which we consider to be south of California Avenue. In addition, community support for the projects is reported in the city's TCC community meetings and survey report. We appreciate your consideration of our request and would be happy to provide additional information. And with the time remaining, um, staff, I would like to know what would be the priority, you can let me know later, what would be the process that we could get the city to consider uh, these projects? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Hightower, and staff will follow up with you. you. Next speaker, please, uh, Mr. Arias, Councilmember Arias. Thank you, Mayor, really quickly. Uh, Troy, thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to work with you over these past couple of months. Uh, transportation and infrastructure is one of my top priorities. It's one of the community's top priorities in, in Southeast Bakersfield. Um, and I'm blown away, frankly, by your wisdom and knowledge of, of putting these projects together. It is not easy, um, but I would ask staff if, if um, we could have uh, someone from economic development uh, reach out to Mr. Troy Hightower and figure out uh, which of those buckets that are currently available that we can 
uh, work with him on and, and, and finding some local support for his projects. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Marcus Crompton. Mr. Crompton. I don't see any movement in the lobby. Uh, next speaker, please. Jeffrey Anthony. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jeffrey. Uh, Hi, my name is Jay, I'm with Bike Bakersfield. I just wanted to thank City Council, all of you guys, for helping us out with a great bike month and allowing us to ride on all the cleaned up bike trails. I also want to thank you guys for approving the bike, the electric bike share program at the last meeting. We're excited for this and we really hope to see you guys out on the streets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Madam Clerk, uh, any other speakers? That was our final speaker for this evening, Mayor. Thank you. So next item, please. Under appointments, we have one appointment at large to the Board of Directors of the North of the River Recreation Park District due to the resignation of Robert LaRoud. Term expires December 31st, 2021. We have received one application from James Neighbors. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I move to appoint... Um... I'm sorry. James Neighbors. James Neighbors to the North River Recreation and Park District. Thank you, and we'll do a roll call vote. If a motion, Madam Clerk, please go ahead and call the roll. Vice Mayor Weir. Yes. Councilmember Arias. Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Gray? Yes. And Councilmember Parlier? Aye. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. Next item, please. Consent calendar items 8A through 8AG for approval. Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. No uh, council members wish to pull or abstain from any item on the agenda, so Jay. I make a motion to approve item 8A through item 8AJ. Thank you. You have a motion, Madam Clerk. Would you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Weir? Yes. Councilmember Arias? Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. Councilmember Gray? Aye. And Councilmember Parlier? Aye. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. It is now time for the consent calendar hearings. The purpose of this section is to vote on all of the items listed under consent calendar hearings in one motion without further comment. If anyone would like to speak on any of the hearing items listed, the item must be removed from this portion of the agenda. If an item is removed, it will be placed at the end of the regular public hearing portion of the meeting. And at this time, I'll open consent calendar public hearing items <coughs> 9A through 9C. Madam Clerk, would you like to read those first? No. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to request that a hearing item be removed from the consent calendar hearing, let me see your hands, please. Seeing none. Does any council member wish to remove an item from the consent calendar hearing? Seeing none, at this time, the consent calendar public hearing items 9A through 9C are now closed. Vice Mayor. I move approval of items 9A through C. You have a motion, and we'll have a roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Weir. Yes. Council Member Arias. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Freeman. 
Aye. Councilmember Gray? Aye. Councilmember Parlier? Aye. Motion is unanim unanimously approved. Thank you. Our next item is public hearings. Each side will be allowed 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes for all speakers per side. So it's important that you identify yourself, make your statement succinctly so others may speak. We'll hear statements from those first opposed to the staff's recommendation. Then we'll hear from those who would like to speak in favor of the staff's recommendation. If there is testimony on both sides, each side will be allowed a five minute rebuttal. There's a clock on the TV screens behind me which indicates 15 minutes. Please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and after 14 minutes, a yellow light will come on. At the end of 15 minutes, a red light will flash indicating your time is up. Quickly end your statement. You may ask questions during your statement, but they won't be addressed until the public hearing is closed. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk. She'll provide copies to the council. Please be courteous to others who wish to speak. Madam Clerk, please read the first public hearing item. Public hearing item 10A. Public hearing to consider adoption of resolution concerning an appeal by Montbatten homeowners regarding Planning Commission's approval of a tentative tract map 7383, located at the northwest corner of Reyna Road and Old Farm Road. Thank you. Mr. Clegg. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. As reflected in the admin report for this item, there's an opportunity for some additional considerations that will require some additional time, and staff is recommending this item be referred back to staff for us to um, work through those additional considerations. So the staff's recommendation is that the City Council continue the public hearing one more time, refer back to staff, and re-notice the appeal hearing once the details of a potential solution are drafted. Council Member Smith, would you like to make the motion? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I would move staff's recommendation. Thank you. You have a motion. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Vice Mayor Weir. Uh, yes. Councilmember Arias. Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Gray. Aye. And Councilmember Parlier. Aye. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public, item, public hearing item 10B. Public hearing to consider an increase in domestic water quantity rates, monthly readiness to serve rates, and monthly private fire protection service rates for fiscal year 21-22, a proposed 4% rate increase. Thank you. Mr. Clegg. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Art Chino, our water manager, will provide a high-level framework for this rate increase. Welcome. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and members of the council. Pleasure to be here. Um, so according to Proposition 218, this is a public hearing to consider a proposed increase to the city of Bakersfield's domestic water system water rates. The objective of my presentation is to give background information on um, this particular rate increase. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So council members, if any time during a public hearing, if you need a break, just let me know. And do we need one right now? We can do one after. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, um, hold on just a minute. This is a, a different presentation. We have another presentation that I had emailed earlier. Mayor, perhaps if we take that break now and we'll get the PowerPoint sorted out. <laughs> that is a brilliant <laughs> suggestion. So let's take a break right now and we'll come back in about five minutes. Okay, we are going to continue item 10B. Mr. Chianello. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. Sorry for that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, mix up in, in uh, presentations. Um, 
like I said, according to Proposition 218, uh, this is a public hearing to consider a proposed increase to the city of Bakersfield's domestic water system rates. Uh, the objective of my uh, presentation is to give background information, uh, give some, and to answer any questions that, that, uh, that uh, might be out there. Just a little bit of background. Um, since 2010, um, the city's water rates have increased twice, uh, once in fiscal year 16, 17, um, and then once in fiscal year 17, 18. And um, um, we're now looking at um, this upcoming uh, fiscal year uh, 21, 22, where we're proposing a 4% rate, rate increase. If I look at this uh, over the last 10 year, 11 year average, um, it's, it's about a 2% increase per year, just for background information um, of a rate increase. That's how it averaged over the last um, 11 years. Um, I discussed this topic at a water board meeting in, in, in March where there were some good, good uh, questions asked, and I hope um, I answered some of them in March, and I also intend to answer some of those questions or give more information tonight. Uh, there's been several large cost increases um, in operating the domestic water system. Um, the largest one, or one of the largest ones, is, is electricity. Um, we actually have gone from about five to six million dollars, an increase of a million dollars just, just for electricity alone. Um, we have a ongoing new cost to us now, uh, removal of the groundwater contaminant 123 TCP. Um, as you know, we've gone through almost about 50 percent of our domestic water wells uh, we're equipped with TCP filtration equipment for like a total of 110 um, granular activated vessels um, throughout our system. And the ongoing maintenance associated with that that has increased in cost is replacement of the granular activated carbon media. Once it's, it's spent, it needs to be removed and new media put in. There's also a tremendous amount of new water quality sampling that goes in that's a part of supporting that TCP removal program. Um, there's um, uh, repair and maintenance costs, and also there's planned, we have some planned capital improvement projects for system improvement. Um, I'm, not, I'm not talking right now about system growth because we do have a water connection fee, and the intent of that water connection fee is where growth pays for growth. Um, I'm not addressing that, and I'm not proposing an increase to that, to that um, water connection fee. This is just for the monthly water rates where this will pay for existing operation and maintenance costs. Um, I will just note that uh, the city's uh, rates uh, continue to be some of the lowest, most competitive rates in the metropolitan area. Um, so this is um, an overview of the Enterprise Fund for Domestic Water on this particular slide. You'll see um, in this particular fiscal year, we have an operating budget of about $25.3 million debt service of approximately $1.35 million, and um, capital improvement projects, our budget for improvements um, is about $2.7 million. So um, it's an overall operating budget of approximately $29.3 million, and um, revenues closely match that, <coughs> around $29.6 $29 million. However, for the upcoming fiscal year, uh, the proposed fiscal year 21-22, uh, the operating budget has increased by about 10%, or about $2.5 million. Uh, a, a big part of that is what, is what I mentioned earlier was electricity, uh, and also increased costs and increased frequencies of, of changing out the granular activated carbon to remove TCP, among a few other, uh, a few other costs. Um, we've also, you can see, we substantially increase the output of, of uh, completing capital improvement projects um, from $2.7 million to $5.1 million. And those capital improvement projects um, have increased dramatically because we actually have the capacity to do that now with, the, with engineer on staff. And we're doing some really great projects uh, in our domestic water system, such as installing emergency generators, we're installing new arsenic treatment at an at, at a, at a existing water well that needed it. Uh, we're installing variable frequency drives. We're installing uh, SCADA electrical equipment so we can monitor our system. So there's lots of uh, good projects out there that, we're, that we have planned. Um, so um, we're also um, proposing a new Engineer 2 position to our assist our Engineer 3, 
um, and you can see that our proposed operating budget in fiscal year 21-22 is about $34.3 million. Um, and revenues would come in, we're estimating our revenues to come in a little bit higher, about a 1.73% increase of about $30.2 million. So um, that gives us um, a little bit of a, a shortfall in revenues as compared to costs. Um, of course, I don't always look at it one year at a time. I look at it like on five-year spans, and I'm always, uh, what, what the next five years of cost will bring. Of course, I have to take into account the growth of our system, and even though we don't have a rate increase, we have growth of our system, and that does generate some extra revenue with extra water sales. So we just have to always take a measured and modest approach to when we look at uh, water rate increases and be mindful of that. Um, some major operational increases, electricity for Pacific Gas and Electric was about a million dollars. We are anticipating or, and have already seen increased costs due to grand or activated carbon changeouts uh, related to uh, the contaminant 123 TCP. And also um, our oper operation and maintenance agreement with Cal Water um, includes um, several components. Um, they're, they're quite honestly, they're just doing a lot more sampling a lot more work on our system. Um, some of the work is covered under the O&M agreement. Some of the work is through separate, um, a separate work order system. Um, and then also, um, um, so this $440,000 is to capture some of the increased operation and maintenance costs that we, that we pay Cal Water to do on our behalf through the operation and maintenance agreement. Um, just, um, a comparison here, uh, again, looking at the city of Bakersfield system compared to other local water purveyors, if we propose, we're proposing a 4% rate increase for an average domestic, uh, an average monthly water bill for a home, um, instead of, uh, it's, it would go from approximately $41.98 to $43.56 per month. And, um, and also this is um, in accordance with Proposition 218, we are opening the hearing tonight, but we will also, staff is also proposing to continue this hearing until the next council meeting. And that's because there's a 45 day notification period. Um, <clears throat> and um, we have um, distributed um, over 46,000 notifications to our customers. And to be sure that all customers that received them, even the ones that received it on April 30th, um, have time, have the 45 day time span to, to make public comments and to provide or written comment, um, we, we, we have to give it another two weeks and come back at the next council meeting on June uh, 16th um, to finish off the hearing at that time. But I thought this was a, a good opportunity to give some background on where we are with our domestic water system, where we are with our costs and operations, and with the proposed rate increase. And with that, I'd like to, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you. Thank you. We'll uh, first go to the public before we come back for questions. So at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? That is those who are against an increase in domestic water qu quantity rates, monthly readiness to serve rates, and monthly private fire protection services rates. So if so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Seeing none, is there anyone who wishes to speak in support of staff's recommendation? Seeing none. So at this time, based on staff's recommendation to continue the hearing to June 16th, 2021, I will keep the public hearing open and return it to council for comment and action. Councilmember Freeman. Um, Art, there's two questions. <clears throat> the carbon filters, about a half a million dollar increase. That's an that's an annual increase. But that's going to happen every year. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Councilmember Freeman, um, it's an annual increase, and um, I can't I cannot project that it's going to increase by five hundred thousand dollars every year. 
but depending on the, the frequency and, the, on, and quite honestly, this uh, granular activated carbon is a commodity and subject to market prices, um, it, it's, it, we will see an increase in the price as well as the frequency because some of our vessels are getting older with the carbon and we will need to change them out. So there will be increased costs, including increased... Okay, um, so these are, this isn't just a result of the, is it the TCP, you know, special filters. This is for filters on all of our wells. We have, we have to put carbon filters. You know, these are just for, Councilmember Freeman, these are just for our TCP wells, but we have a, approximately 35 wells um, that are having this treatment, which is a little bit over than 50% of all of our domestic water wells have this treatment it for is, TCP. because they've only been up and running, what, two years, and we're already having this kind. It sounds like an ongoing extra cost oh. as a result of these wells. It's definitely an ongoing extra operation and maintenance cost. Okay. Um, the, the lifespan of the granular activated carbon, depending on how much the particular well is pumped and the concentration of the TCP in that particular well, we can do a carbon change out every year, um, the frequency, or it could be maybe up to three years, okay. depends on the water okay. well. And the PG&E costs were up a million dollars. That again is, an, this is an annual budget. Why, I mean, they didn't raise the race that much, I don't think. So how come just, how come it, it'll cost us a million dollars more a year to PG&E for operating our wells? Um, the, 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 the rates, um, at least for our domestic water system, they, they have increased. Um, I can say that um, we are using um, uh, the wells more because they do have the treatment on them right now. And so it's a matter of us, I think, using the wells more. Um, it's still um, more cost effective to, to do that than maybe, um, 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 you know, well, we have about 30% we could send through the treatment plants, but we really we have to pump the groundwater because about 70% of our domestic water comes from the ground. But we have more wells online that are running because of uh, we have this treatment in place. And that coupled with, there has been some increases to the PG&E rate, which, which cumulatively I mean, gets up to about, about a million dollars. I can't know, give you a percentage. Do you even know what PG&E increase by 10%, 20, 30, any, any, any idea what they about, increased? I, I would say we're, we, we've seen it to go from about $5 million to $6 million would be. Um, um, That's a 20% increase. Yeah. That's, I mean, are we pumping a lot more because of the drought? Are we gener using more electricity? Um, we, we pump more during drier years um, than, than we also, than we do during the wetter years, of course. Um, and so that, that's one reason. So it, it's, it's, it could be hydrographics or okay. the hydrology, but it's also simply because our system is growing and we have higher demands. We, we don't oh, okay. necessarily add new wells all the time, but those wells maybe are pumping more than 12 hours a day. They might yeah. be pumping 15 hours okay. a day to, to reach to reach more, uh, you know, to reach more of our metered water system customers, because we, we could grow around 1,000 metered customers a year on average. On a, on a very busy year, we could grow by 2,000 metered customers. And so there's more pumping, okay. uh, more demand pumping. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <laughs> could, you go back, could you go back to the next to the last slide you had? Please. Not the last one, the one before that. Yeah. Um, Julie, can you um, get that presentation back up, please? Okay. The one before that. Uh, oh. Let's see here. This one? There we go. So, You know, I, I'm, I'm in the Cal Water area, and, uh, you know, the average rate at Cal Water at, 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 that's on this screen is, it could probably multiply that by four for my no, normal water bill. So, years ago, when I was actively involved with Cal Water, and we were opposing their rate increases and that kind of stuff, one of the big items was a flat rate home. 
and they had a specific schedule that they were going to try to go to get the flat rates. So my question is, are they making any progress in the flat rates? So because as soon as they start capturing that, their, their revenue is going to go up, I, I assume. Um, Councilmember Weir. Um, and, and you don't have to answer that tonight if you don't know. You could. Okay. Um, if you could get back to us, that would, or to me, or the okay. council. Um, I, I will get back to you. And we have Tammy Johnson from, from Cal Waters here. And maybe she'll look at, help, help me look into that as well. Um, no, you, you don't yeah. have to okay. respond tonight. Okay. But if you could get back to us, that would be great. Okay. Well, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Art, for your presentation. I'm looking at the second slide when we look at the um, slide that's titled Recommended 4% Domestic Rate Increase. Under capital improvements, we see a, a increase of $2.4 million or 89% change in uh, fiscal year 21-22. Um, you did reference future years beyond 21-22. And so I know in our proposed budget for the water department as a whole, uh, you submitted um, a capital improvement program, five-year plan. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you can provide the council a five-year plan for just the domestic water division uh, for capital improvement so we can get a better sense of what, what that looks like beyond this next fiscal year. I, I have a draft with me I could show you tonight, Councilmember Gonzalez. For, if you can just provide a copy for the council, I'd appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Colleagues, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Chinanella. Thank you. And now, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I just motion to continue to keep the public hearing open. I move to keep the public hearing open. Correct? Correct, and uh, continue it to June and, 16th. And, and continue it to June 16th. Why, why don't you tell me what I meant to say? <laughs> How about a motion uh, with uh, approving staff's recommendation? That will be perfect, thank you. Thank you, you have a motion. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Weir. Yes. Council Member Arias. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Freeman. Yes. Councilmember Gray? Yes. And Councilmember Parlier? Aye. Motion was unanimously approved. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next hearing item, please. Public hearing item 10C, a public hearing to consider resolution adopting refuse and recycling rates for fiscal year 2021 and 2022. Number one. A resolution adopting increases to fiscal year 2021-22 refuse recycling rates. And number two, a resolution providing for the collection of residential and commercial refuse and recycling charges by the Kern County Auditor Controller's Office. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Acting Director Stuart Patterson will speak to this item. Thank you. Um, Mayor Go, members of the council, Stuart Pattison, acting public works director, um, give you a brief um, presentation to supplement the administrative reports you have on this item. Um, most of the council here are aware of the background uh, regarding recyclables and, and the market changes that continue to impact city's operations and the solid waste operations for all communities. Um, prior to 2017, the recycling of blue cart material and wood chips served as a source of revenue for the city. Since 2017, recycling these materials is now an expense. Uh, the country of China shut down importing of all recyclables, as some of you know, and the market went from um, obtaining $60 a ton, roughly, for recycled material to costing us at one at one period, uh, $190 per ton. And staff has explored many alternatives to lower recycling costs. However, there's no foreseeable change in the market. Um, another contributing factor, uh, the city contracts, as, as you know, half the collection services to outside private haulers. 
their rates by contract are tied to a consumer price index escalator, which for this year is 0.9%, uh, so that will be reflected in the coming fiscal year. The rate, increase, <clears throat> the rate increase will help cover these additional expenses for the haulers, but it ends up being a cost to the solid waste fund. Um, also, the implementation and enforcement of SB Centerville 1383 um, further increases landfill diversion requirements in the form of diverting organic waste particularly food waste. And so this legislation will have financial impacts to the refuse enterprise, including um, we're gonna be proposing in our budget um, a new position that will be needed to perform inspections and enforcement. And this program could grow over time uh, depending on the level of uh, inspection and enforcement needed for both commercial and residential. Um, more more food waste will be taken to the green waste site, which will result in additional processing and operational costs for that facility. Um, and additional routes for uh, blue cart and green cart collection may need to be incorporated in future years to ensure SB 1383 requirements are met. Um, staff is proposing a 5% rate increase for fiscal year 2021-22 to ensure sufficient revenues available and to avoid any reduction in the solid waste reserve. The single family residential rate will go from $223 to $234 per year. So that's an $11 per year increase, a little less than a dollar a month. The multifamily rate will go from $200.51 to $210.52, basically a $10 per year increase. And commercial rates um, will increase 5% across the board based on our um, pricing structure. Um, I have a chart, I don't have it with me. You'll see it on our budget presentation. Most of you have seen it before that will show that even with this rate increase, Bakersfield still has one of the lowest rates of the comparable cities in the state. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Pattison. And at this time, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? That is, those who are against adopting the refuse and recycling rates. If so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Seeing none, is there anyone who wishes to speak in support of staff's recommendation. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and return it to council for comment and action. Vice Mayor. Thank you. When, uh, just to refresh my memory a little bit, when we bought the new recycling center, um, are we supposed to get like semi-annual reports on the money it's saving us? Could we have projections like, is that already part of what we're doing or? Yes, Vice Mayor, we are gonna be bringing back uh, semi-annual reports on uh, what are the, both the operating costs uh, overall as well as the revenues that come in. Uh, that was part of the council motion on that item and, and we'll bring that back. It's somewhat out of sequence from our budget process, maybe in this first year, uh, uh, I hadn't thought of this until just now, but w we can probably do some updates uh, that get us on sync so that we would be at each new fiscal year and, and mid-year budget. That would make sense. And there, is there a way to um, specifically point the savings from purchasing that facility? Yes, we can do that. Like every six months? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I, it made me think, Stuart, when you mentioned that we have some of the lowest rates, <clears throat> and we hear that all the time, and I wondered when we, uh, when the county raised their rates for the landfill, when we're looking at comparable rates, are we including the landfill rates? Do other people include the landfill rates, or is it all just the uh, trash haulers. 
I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if in those surveys, if we are specific. Maybe Mr. Maybe Huot. Mr. Huot knows. Thinks he's got an answer. Uh, I, I think I can answer that question if you don't mind me jumping in. Uh, I think the question is, you're, you're talking about the land use fee that goes on the property tax bill? Correct. The county yeah. land use. So plus, I believe when, So we pay when, two fees. We pay the county land. Correct. So I believe uh, the rates that Mr. Patterson uh, is presenting tonight are separate from that fee because the county is the one that assesses that fee to all properties countywide. Uh, so the, the fee tonight that uh, Mr. Patterson uh, presented, I believe, uh, I'm going off memory, but the county just proposed uh, their annual rates, and I want to say it's around $280 a year to give you kind of that equivalent right. apples to apples comparison, which that 280 a year doesn't include that, that separate land use fee. That's an additional amount that goes on the property tax roll. Right, I get that. My question is, when we're comparing with other cities, do those other cities compare both, are we compare, does, does theirs include both fees? Uh, I mean, if you're looking at San Francisco, it's a city and county of San Francisco, right. maybe it's maybe it's one fee and, and we're slicing and dicing. C cities do it a little bit different, but I would say that, that San Francisco is probably gonna be your unique example uh, where others are recouping the direct cost for providing that service and don't normally operate the, the landfill. Some cases they do, some cases they don't. Um, but I believe normally what we're doing is comparing just the uh, annual single family fee uh, for providing that service, not the land use fee. And I don't think other cities, for the most part, are including that in their, their bill. That's a separate line item, I guess I okay. would say. Okay, Always. so typically it's separate line item. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Colleagues, any other requests to speak? Seeing none, Vice Mayor. I move staff's recommendation on this item. Thank you. You have a motion. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Weir? Yes. Council Member Arias? Aye. Council Member Gonzalez? Aye. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Freeman? Yes. Council Member Gray? Aye. Council Member Parlier? Aye. M Mayor, motion. I'm, sorry. sorry motion ahead. is unanimously approved. Mr. Clegg? Yeah, just wanted to um, make one comment on this item um, and following up on inquiries previously from Councilmember Parlier to look at programs that would allow us to help those on fixed incomes or seniors uh, with the impacts of rate increases. Because of uh, laws around Proposition 218, there are, sig there are specific limitations for us to be able to have programs such as those um, because it is based on a rate payer basis. And so We've continued to look for creative ways to think about solutions to that. But again, the, the 218 uh, regulations uh, severely limit our ability to, to do that. And one of the ways that we've been able to uh, accommodate for those considerations is by just trying to keep our rates as low as possible as, as reflected in these two comparisons you saw tonight, that we continue to remain much lower than other areas. But we're always keeping in mind those that might be on fixed incomes and, and the impacts the rates cause for them. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Yeah. Uh, Madam Clerk, the vote. Yeah. The motion was unanimously approved. Yeah. Thank you. Now, the next item, please. Under public hearings, item 10D, public hearing for the fiscal year 2021 to 2022 operating and capital improvement program budgets. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Mr. Chris Huot will speak to this item. Uh, good Welcome. evening once again, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. I will be very brief. Uh, each year, this public hearing is required to receive public comment prior to the adoption of the budget. The fiscal year 22 proposed budget as it is uh, currently uh, outlined is $684.6 million. That includes both operating and our, the city's capital budget as proposed for next year. The operating budget as proposed is $582.3 million. And the, oper or the capital budget, excuse me, is $102.2 million as proposed 
uh, final adoption of the budget is scheduled for June 16th. Uh, in between now and that time, we will have another budget workshop, I believe next Monday, uh, to round out the remaining department budgets. Uh, with that being said, tonight staff is recommending the City Council receive public testimony on the budget. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hewat. And at this time, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to Steph's recommendation? If so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. And just as a reminder, we have 15 minutes for each side. Mayor Go, before we begin with the public comments, um, staff memorandum has been received transmitting additional correspondence uh, regarding this item after the publication of the agenda. Thank you. Welcome, please identify yourself and go ahead. Hi, my name is Brandi Woolsey. Um, I am in opposition of the proposed budget. Um, I am here to represent People's Budget of Bakersfield. So I'm about to read um, what we stand for, what we're about. Um, the People's Budget of Bakersfield is a black-led and black-centered grassroots coalition that is several years in the making. Throughout the city of Bakersfield, Black and brown organizers have been fighting for police accountability and reform dating back to the early 2000s and building upon the work of our elders. In a year where COVID-19 has ravaged our communities and our elected officials dragged their feet and did the bare minimum, we took care of each other. In a year where pandemic relief funds and measure end dollars continue to support gentrifying and anti-homeless businesses and the anti-black BPD. We initiated grassroots efforts to provide rent relief, food distribution, and cash assistance to help our community survive. Community members came together this past year to put together a visionary budget that truly meets the safety, well-being, economic, and health needs of all communities by centering and lifting up the needs of the most marginalized. We have done what the city manager, the city council, and the Measure N Citizens Oversight Committee has refused to do again and again, a participatory budgeting process that actively seeks and incorporates what the community really wants their dollars to go towards. So we created our own. Led by black organizers with the needs of black people in the forefront, we are challenging the way things are done and reimagining what our world could look like. This is a coalition created for the people, by the people, and we will win. So our goal is to defund, to abolish the police. We, the residents of Bakersfield, demand that Bakersfield City Council defund the Bakersfield Police Department and put an end to their history of terrorizing and murdering Bakersfield residents. As stated by The Guardian in 2015, BPD is the deadliest police force in the nation and police in Bakersfield have caused insurmountable amounts of trauma to black, indigenous communities of color through the Bakersfield area. We, the people of Bakersfield, have watched in horror as BPD and the elected officials fail to take accountability and have watched our elected officials discredit, censor, or flat out ignore the sheer brutality of their police force. Not after the countless murders, not after the countless media interviews and articles from local, state, national, and even international news outlets. Not even after the California Department of Justice launched an investigation into the BPD. Never have the BPD or the KCSO taken responsibility and worked with community members to implement real policy change, accountability, or transparency. We are the survivors of state violence and have lost hope that, one, the Bakersfield Police Department wants to make a good faith effort to reform and be held accountable by the communities they serve. Number two that the Bakersfield Police Department has the capacity or desire to even change. This is why we, the residents of Bakersfield, demand that you defund the Bakersfield Police Department as a step towards abolishing the police. The People's Budget Process. The People's Budget Bakersfield was created through a community-led participatory process of political education, organizing surveys, and community meetings through May 2021. Bakersfield residents were asked to envision how they would spend the approximately $293 million dedicated to the city's general funds and the $96 million that the city will receive in federal American Rescue Plan funds towards seven key investment asks 
that expanded upon last year's people's budget. Each of these responses served as critical data points and we took the average of the total range of participant budget responses to determine the final funding amount in the people's budget. The seven asks, invest in black and indigenous Bakersfield residents and other residents of color. Number one, violence prevention, non-policing. Number two, youth development and education, including black-centered education. Number three, public health and mental health. Number four, city racial equity policies and plans. Number five, affordable housing and homeless services. Number six, building black economic equity programs. Number seven, city reparations to black and indigenous communities. Budgets are a moral document. This year, people's budget was developed last year through a participatory process of hundreds of survey responses and updated this year through focus group surveys and community meetings. In contrast, the city's general fund from last year, which was collected from taxes from everyday people, was spent according to special interests and the status quo, which continues to cause black residents and other residents of color to suffer. So, number one, the violence prevention non-policing. To go into depth, we are asking for $65 million to go towards this. Bullet point number one, street interventionists. We want six million to go towards this, to invest into street interventions, violence interrupters, neighborhood captains, and mediators as an alternative to police to help reduce the involvement and reliance of police in our neighborhoods. Bullet point number two, community education, investment in programs and resources that have been proven to help prevent crime, such as housing and community education. We're asking for six million to go towards this. Root cause investments, deal with material conditions that lead to poverty to reduce crime. Number two, the youth development and education services. We're asking for 60 million to go towards this. Bullet point number one, youth basic needs, investment in programs that address food and housing insecurity for youth and families to ensure success. Career development, career development program for black youth, including trans slash non-binary, slash gender, slash non-conforming youth. Bullet point, point number three, youth mental health, free individual psychotherapy, slash counseling, group therapy, medication, recreational therapies. Bullet point number four, teacher training, investment in trauma-informed training for educators, aides, and other working with youth. Bullet point number five, child care, funds to support black-owned, culturally competent, and multilingual childcare services for communities of color. Housing options for low income and black indigenous people of color caretakers. All right, our next, next ask, we are asking for 7,700 uh, million to go towards black-centered education, black-centered curriculum. Hire more black teachers in black Africana ethnic studies education integrated into the academic system. Investment in implementing black center curriculum in community centers and other institu institutions utilized for community education. Okay, number three, public health, including mental and behavioral health. We're asking for 55 million to go towards this. Substance abuse, investment in grassroots slash community-based organizations that support community members on working through substance abuse to give them the ability to increase services to act as an alternative to police custody and under the influence cases. We're asking for five million to go towards this specifically. Decriminalize substance abuse. Next bullet point. Non-carceral resources to help with addiction. Next bullet point, require a portion of funds allocated to social service providers to hiring formerly incarcerated community members. Crisis response, have MET teams to send out for crisis calls and not the police. We're also asking to invest into city and county partnership to address mental health needs for black indigenous people of color residents. Our next, next ask, City racial equity policies and plans. We're asking for 35 million to go towards this. Participatory budgeting, something we've been asking for. 
The community has a say so and where funds are allocated. The community needs to be able to hold the city accountable for allocating money to areas that abandon the community. Partner with community organizations that are already supporting similar efforts for our Black, Indigenous, People of Color community. To ensure true accountability is possible, first, the processes and complete budget should be shared in an accessible, clear and direct, easy to understand and make sense of in a way that there are clear indicators of how to actually budget, sorry, how to actually budget um, allocations look in comparison to the adopted budget and intentions behind the budget are honored. And then secondly, there needs to be clear channels for giving community feedback and criticism where needed. Community accountability processes. Require each council member to hold monthly meetings with their ward to inform, strategize with, and listen to the community members in their ward six months before the city manager staff starts working on the budget draft to submit to the city council. Mandated classes slash budget presentations held bi-monthly on weekends and evenings for the community to learn about, participate in, and comment on the budget. Next, civilian-wide survey of concerns, comments, and budget proposals. Next, encourage racial equity-based decision-making and investments in Bakersfield. Next bullet point, equity-based budgeting. Divest from police and reinvest in the most impacted Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. Black center programs. Participatory budgets where Black residents slash most affected people are centered in a table talk for funds, plus there is a paper trail for what is discussed slash agreed upon, plus that there's accessibility in trying to contact officials so people can bring concerns up as they come up. Fun, fun quick solutions collaboratively with police officials. Lastly, Black-led community gardens. Uprooting racism from our food system and food apartheid, using our hands and being barefoot in the garden to better our mental health. Our next ask, housing and homeless services. We're asking for $32 million to go towards this. Affordable housing. Commitment to a homes guarantee for Bakersfield residents that includes intent to provide reparations and land back to black and indigenous residents. Utilize land trust to build affordable housing out of abandoned land and properties. Review housing element programs. Legal leverage to negotiate with city if they have not implemented these programs and are out of compliance with law. Invest in ongoing rental and mortgage assistance program. Addressing owed rent when considered payment slash budget, budget amounts to prevent evictions and keep people in their homes. Investment in right to counsel program to protect and support tenants from eviction and unlawful detainer proceedings. Next, homeless services. Commitment by the city to review barriers and hindrances with current unhoused support organizations. We're asking for 15 million to go to this specifically. Group of unhoused slash formerly unhoused individuals working with landlords to get housing units available at no cost up front, followed by low cost rent. Investment in grassroots organizations who provide food, water, and hygiene supplies to unhoused people. Next ask, ask number six, black economic equity programs were asking for 30 million. Cultural community resource centers. All inclusive community centers that include things like showers, hydrate, hydration stations, community gardens, industrial kitchen spaces, community resource hubs with info and guidance on access services with community leaders in charge of hiring the people who run it. Hiring should focus on hiring people from those communities. Next, universal basic income. Next, public pro processes to, to report and resolve discrimination issues. Next, small businesses support grants, business loans, and tax breaks for small black-owned businesses and other people of color-owned businesses. Next, black business division. New black business division within the economic development department that facilitates city contracting with black businesses, living wage requirements, support for co-ops, grants, tax support, and small business assistance programs. Our last ask, our seventh ask, City reparations to black and indigenous residents, 30 million. 
investment in reparations to historically divested neighborhoods, specifically Southeast Bakersfield, due to the history of abuse, disinvestment, neglect, and over-policing done to the land and residents of the Southeast community to the city of Bakersfield. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolseley. We have 50, 49 seconds left. Uh, next speaker, please. Hi, my name is uh, Cassidy Shepard, and I'm here to echo that I also oppose um, the current budget that's being proposed, and I support the People's Budget BACO. Um, it is something that is incredibly necessary. It is not necessary to give 43% of the budget to police, that there's a huge discrepancy between support of the public and support of the police. And as has been stated before, there is increased crime since there has been increased money into policing. So clearly policing is not working and we need to look at solutions to actually combat crime and actually support our communities. And the People's Budget Bakersfield does this. Now I'm gonna start listing off names of people who do support it. Sofia Nuno, Guadalupe Gonzalez, Arisbeli Velez, Anoki P, Isabel Ton. Ms. Shepard, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, is there anyone who wishes to speak in support of staff's recommendation those who wish to speak in support of staff's recommendation, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Welcome. Hi, uh, Mayor Go, Vice Mayor Weir, uh, members of the council. Uh, my name is Kaylin Peterson. I'm representing the Greater Bakersfield Chamber. Uh, we're the largest and broadest business organization in Bakersfield. We have over 11,000, uh, sorry, 1,100 members, uh, which collectively employ over 70,000 Californians. As you know, in April of this year, our Chamber PAC released statistically valid uh, polling data that showed that an overwhelming majority of Bakersfield voters would like the city to prioritize and fund efforts to reduce and address homelessness, increase public safety, and boost the economy. Earlier today, we submitted a letter on behalf of a broad coalition of business organizations in Bakersfield urging the city to prioritize investment in these high priority areas. Combined, our coalition represents hundreds of thousands of Californians and Bakersfield workers and residents. I'm here today to share our support for the city's efforts to tackle these areas um, and urge the city to continue to prioritize these issues, not only in the general fund budget, but in Measure N PSVS uh, funds. Our poll indicated that almost 80% of voters want Measure N funds spent to address homelessness. Increasing public safety, particularly the hiring of more police officers, was the second most important priority to voters. The business community and our coalition would like to also echo these vital spending priorities laid out by voters. As many businesses begin to re-inhabit their offices, the worry over the rise in homelessness is of great concern. And our businesses need to feel safe to return back to work. The business community stands behind the city's plans to increase public safety responsibly and equitably. We know that the ultimate goal is the hiring and the addition of more sworn police officers. However, we would also recommend addressing public safety concerns with more non-sworn personnel. Additionally, our coalition recognizes the need to invest in community policing programs. That builds bridges between law enforcement and the residents that they serve. Our members have been the beneficiaries of these efforts to increase the lines of communication and cooperation between business and the Bakersfield Police Department. We think all communities and interests should have the same opportunity, and we're certain that such investments will yield similar and positive results. We commend you today for addressing these priority issues in the upcoming budget, and we urge your council to just continue the necessary steps to make sure that voters and our businesses feel like their tax dollars are being spent on the issues that matter most to them. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in support of staff's recommendation? Seeing none, now is there anyone who wishes to rebut in, in opposition to staff's recommendation? Seeing none, is there anyone who wishes to 
rebut in support of staff's recommendation. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and return it to council for comment and action. I don't see any requests yet to speak. I have no request to speak. Uh, by, uh, no, we, we do have. Councilmember Gray. I just want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for coming tonight and speaking out for the majority of people in our community that are wanting to fund our police, that public safety is number one. And we have to continue to listen to those voices, listen to our, our uh, business owners in this community that are providing all these jobs for all these other people. And I'm just really thankful that you came tonight to, to speak on behalf of the majority. We needed that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. Any other requests to speak, colleagues? Uh, Ms. Peterson, you had mentioned that there was a coalition that you were representing. Would you be able to just name the members of the coalition, please? I know there were a number of organizations. Yeah, absolutely. So we have the Greater Bakersfield Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Black Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Associated Builders and Contractors, the Kern County Builders Exchange, and the Bakersfield Association of Realtors. Oh, and the homeowner, the Kern County Homeowners, uh, Home Builders Association, I apologize. So in total, we're seven large business organizations. Like I said, our, our organization alone represents over 1,100 businesses, 70,000 Californians. Together, our seven large, co uh, seven large businesses represent hundreds of thousands of Californians and hundreds of thousands of residents in Bakersfield and businesses in Bakersfield. And like I said, we support public safety, addressing homelessness, um, and that it looks like a range of things. And our coalition looks forward to partnering with you in the future to continue to spread that message to our members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, just want to thank all the speakers tonight. You know, um, it, from my perspective, having reached out to so many people throughout the community through um, Measure N and certainly throughout the ward um, over the years, um, you know, public safety is the number one consideration and hiring 100 police officers is the top priority. And I, I don't see any um, wavering from that. Um, but I do understand the need for us to respond to certain disparities within our community and to understand that in order for us to make a, a safer and healthier city that we need to address issues like affordable housing, like addressing homelessness in a thoughtful, uh, systemic way. There are uh, issues related to community development and making sure that there's access in, in uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods to uh, prosperity that, uh, that we address. And so, um, well, I, th I don't think what's getting out to the public, though, is our efforts that we are making towards those goals. And in this, even in this proposed budget, there are so many things that we're doing that are beneficial for our community. And so I just want to ask staff again to, to resurrect um, the efforts to promote all of the work that we're doing via PSVS, uh, pushing that out to the community via um, regular newsletters and other communications so that the, the general public is aware of all of the work that we're doing uh, with, with regard to PSVS. The expectations are very, very high right now. Um, and we're only in you know, the third year. Uh, there, and so it's gonna take us a while to ramp up, but, but it's important for us to communicate clearly and consistently um, in order for, for the general public to understand what, what's really happening at City Hall. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez, Vice Mayor. No, sure. All right. And now, next item, Madam Clerk. Reports number item 11A, quarterly homeless update, part one, presentation by the executive director of Mercy House on progress at the Brundage Lane Navigation Center. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Public safety and homelessness are number one. And so uh, we're pleased to have a couple of reports tonight that reflect on 
uh, homelessness, and we have Larry Haynes with uh, Mercy House and uh, Theo Dues as well with Mercy House to provide an update on the Brundage Lane Navigation Center. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Thank you for having us. I know you've been here a while, so we'll try and speak as quickly as we can uh, to move on. In our overview, we're going to want to talk about um, um, some critical data in terms of what's going on uh, at the Navigation Center, um, some of our experiences regarding our community support and community outreach. I uh, want to quickly touch base on some emerging issues and places where I think we can and need to improve, um, and then conclude our presentation with a new initiative uh, that we're launching as well, and happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. All right. Am I not doing the right one? Is there a trick that I'm not doing? You haven't been given the password yet. What's that? <laughs> yeah, I saw, I, saw, I saw your... Um, can, can somebody help him, please? Yeah. I'd... So what am I pointing at then? Okay, cool. Um, sorry, we'll go ahead and be brief. One of the things I want to note in terms of the data that you see before us, this is taken at a point in time, um, which was two or three weeks ago, so obviously some of this is a little bit dated. Um, I would point your attention to the number of clients in the current shelter. We are um, um, at capacity. I believe there may, may be one opening right now, so that number is a little bit higher. I think our number is 129. The other number, other couple numbers that are worth noting is the number of total house. That is permanent housing. I want to emphasize that. And that number um, is now up to 45 since the time that we did this. What's not included in that, that we would include in other reports that we give, there are an additional 25 people um, that have been moved on either into some sort of transitional housing, a more appropriate institutionalized setting, or have moved back with family. And so uh, that's, if you add the 25 to the 45, we're starting to make some significant progress. Um, um, I think the number matched 25. What that means is that we have 25 people in our shelter right now who have um, been matched to um, housing opportunities. And so the next time I see you, we expect these numbers to go up um, um, fairly significantly. Um, as you can see, we're participating uh, in the overall system. And while I am thrilled with these numbers, especially for a navigation center that has been open as uh, short a period of time as it has, and as much as I would like to take credit for this, um, the truth of the matter is the housing outcomes that you're seeing is the result of a good system that's working. It's us participating in the system, and this has to do with our other nonprofit and community partners that are on the other end of this system in terms of getting people placed in housing. Um, one of the key things when you want to cite these things, obviously they are always, thank you for the laugh, um, they are always a little difficult to place, right? Nimbianism is a big issue. Um, it is always, a, it is always a, there's always a measure of political courage, whether it's affordable housing, a shelter navigation center to get it placed. As of date, we still do not have any issues with any of our neighbors. Our neighbors, um, um, instead of complaining about us, instead of us having an adverse impact on our surrounding neighborhood, we have nothing but support from our neighbors thus far. Uh, and we're very proud of that. Um, um, a good neighbor policy, a good neighbor ethic is a big deal to uh, Mercy House. At this point in time, I will turn it over to my program manager, Theo Dews, to talk about our partnerships and uh, other community involvement. Thank you, Larry. Would you keep that and advance the slide for me so I don't have the same trouble you had? Honorable Mayor, City Council members, uh, having managed homeless services for most of my professional life, I've learned that any shelter is only as strong as the partnerships that it develops in the community. And this city was very progressive in designing your navigation center with a number of built-in partnerships. Flood Ministries, Bakersfield Police Department, Code Enforcement, Kern Medical, Kern Behavioral Health. And I'm very happy to report that under Mercy House Management, all of those partnerships have thrived. I personally sit in meetings with each of those agencies every week to ensure that the partnerships remain strong and to address any issues that may arise. Can you advance the slide, Lori? Thank you. Now, in addition to the strong built-in partnerships that we have, we've begun to develop some new partnerships in the community. And this really was not possible during the height of the COVID crisis, but now that restrictions are lifting, we have begun to develop partnerships with Critters Without Litters, who will provide all of our pet care, uh, with uh, Martin Luther King Community Center, who is providing on-site fitness classes for our guests. We now have on-site AA and NA meetings every week. And we have a new partnership with Bike Bakersfield, who is providing bicycle maintenance classes for our guests. 
And in the days ahead, we will continue to build strategic partnerships in the community in order to give our guests the very best chance of gaining and sustaining permanent housing. Larry? One of the things that we always want to bring up to council are whatever potential emerging issues are. We want to talk about what's working well and what's not working well. And just to hold us accountable, the last time we met three months ago, we identified three, um, three emerging issues. One was collaboration with other providers. I think we've made significant progress in that since we've seen you last. We've met with a number of the other partners in the community. Uh, Mercy House has also joined several of the subcommittees of the COC uh, committee as well. And uh, we're excited to be a part of the local system and the local community in addressing homelessness. And I think we're, we're branching out and, and, and making some good friendships. Um, the other thing that we talked about, and this is still ongoing, is creating a plan for guests who cannot perform their daily living activities. Um, that I am, I am really happy to, to say that I think, again, we've made some very significant progress since we've last met. Um, there are, are, are multiple uh, uh, multiple hospitals and healthcare agencies that are interested in working with us on this. And so I think we are rounding the corner to, to provide this very important uh, uh, care um, um, at the shelter itself. Um, the third thing that we talked about, again, when I was here last, was that Mercy House needed to do a better job of connecting into the system in terms of connecting people to housing. As was reported, I believe, in our outcomes and the fact that we are participating in those committees and the, testament, the testimony of 25 people sitting in our shelter right now that have been matched with housing, I think we've, we've done that as well. There are a couple of issues, though, that are worth noting, that are worth keeping our eyes on. And probably if there is a cloud on the horizon, it's the first point under current issues, which um, is our early exits. If you look at some of our data, we have too many people that are just leaving early, that are just simply disappearing. We are not exiting them. We are not kicking out folks. We are running a low threshold, low barrier shelter. But we do have too many people that are just sort of leaving and disappearing into the ether. I do want to say that this is not an uncommon problem. This is, this is an issue, this is a dynamic that happens nationwide. There are a number of us across the country that are trying to figure out best practices, try and, and, and prevent this from happening. It kind of goes with the turf. Doesn't mean that we concede the point, doesn't mean that we don't continue to work on it, but I would say if there is a dark cloud, I think, on our performance thus far, it's trying to figure that out. Uh, you will also note, you could tie the, uh, my concern about this into our previous number, um, whereas our commitment is to have 100% of all of our, our guests there to have housing plans, our number is really only about 90%. The reason for that is, is, is a couple of things. Number one, we've had some early entries, and so there's just simply a time lag. So that makes sense. But the truth of the matter is, and we're not going to solve it here tonight, but something we want to work with the city on and our other community partners, we do have a handful of people that are in our shelter right now that have no interest in working in housing whatsoever. And here I'm not talking about people who are incapacitated and unable to. It just isn't simply a part of their plan. It's an it's a, it's a extreme minority, but I don't want us to lose our housing-centric focus. And so we need to figure out the appropriate response. We need to either fix this or maybe modify our policies. But that is the one thing I think we all need to keep our eyes on. Finally, I would be remiss if I, if I stood before a city council and didn't advocate for more housing. You want a better shelter? You want a better navigation center? You want to improve our performance, the performance of every shelter in town? Build more housing. We need to build more exits. The key to successful shelter in any city across the country is what is your housing plan? What is your housing strategy? And the more we can develop permanent supportive housing and extremely low income housing, the better it is for all of us. Uh, with that, we will end our presentation before going into questions. Um, I'm going to bring up Theo again to talk about a kitchen and culinary training program that we're about ready to launch that we're extremely excited about. When your navigation center opened, the kitchen was still under construction, and thus far we have partnered with the superintendent of schools for the provision of all the meals. But our kitchen is now fully operational, and in just a couple of weeks, we're going to assume all the responsibility for the preparation and the service of meals internally. And mayor and council members, I am really excited about this. Because throughout human history, one of the more, most important ways we share our love is through the sharing of food. And we now have a wonderful opportunity to share our love with our guests. But what I'm even more excited about is the launch of our culinary training program. We have designed an intensive 10-week training program in the culinary arts. And 
We will be um, partnered with the Kern Restaurant Association to provide job opportunities for our graduates. And all I can tell you today is I look forward to sharing the success stories of the culinary training program in future presentations. Thank you. I know I speak for Theo and our entire staff. We are very grateful to the investment that the city has made in the Brundage Lane Navigation Center, the investment you've made in us. Uh, we are very honored to, to serve you and to serve this community. Um, and we are happy to answer any questions you might have for us. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Thank you, Mr. Dews. Councilmember Arias. Uh, first, I want to say that was rather quick, so uh, pretty impressive well, there. I was trying to help <laughs> out, man. <laughs> uh, it really just want to take a second to thank you gentlemen. Uh, as you guys have seen throughout uh, today's meeting, you are at the forefront of the most critical issue that we as a city are facing, as a state we are facing. So I want to thank you. Kudos to you guys for uh, everything that you do and, and from an ideological perspective, uh, thanks so much for putting so much emphasis on the housing and, and getting and, and placing folks in into more permanent housing. I do appreciate that. I do have a couple questions for you. As we start building out these um, programs and, and, and getting folks placed into job training programs and getting them ready to re-enter the workforce, I wanted to see what is what, to what extent do you guys have a relationship with an ETR employment? Employee Training Resource, I hope I'm uh, quoting that correctly, or America's Job Center. I think they're at the forefront of, of getting folks placed into those job training programs. So I just wanted to see what's what's the nature of your guys' relationship there. I'm going to allow Theo to answer that specifically, but um, what, and we will answer, but I just want to remind council that, yes, we are doing a job training program. The emphasis of, a, of, a, of the proper emphasis of any navigation center, though, is always going to be housing, right? right? All the other stuff comes secondary. And so we want to make sure that we're streamlined and that is our focus. Um, and even in our own job training program, our hope is that people will have moved out and will return and continue the training um, there, even though they will already have been housed. So I, I'm not suggesting that's not important and that we don't have that. But I want to remember as we talk about um, um, secondary and supportive services that we don't lose sight, our job, our job is not to fix the entire person. Our job is to get them document ready, to get them uh, to create a housing plan and get them ready for that next step to connect them uh, to permanent housing, of which obviously earning an income is, is a critical part uh, as they move on. But, uh, but with that, Theo? Sure. Uh, Councilman Arias, I, I would just uh, state again that we're just emerging from a COVID crisis during which partnerships were very difficult. Uh, now that we are emerging from this and now that we're entering the, the job training arena to some degree, I think the partnerships you just mentioned would be very strategic for us. I'd love to pursue those. We have not yet, but I, I would love to discuss that further with you and pursue those partnerships. Fantastic. I would, I would love to do that. Maybe we set up a call here in the near future to, to discuss that. Happy to make that connection. Um, my other question is more related to housing. Um, I know you stated that, you know, we need more housing, we need more funding to, to build more homes um, and, and that sort of thing. My question to you is, I, I noticed that it, it seemed like we were getting folks placed into housing uh, at a much faster rate as we were opening up the Brundage, Brundage Lane Navigation Center. I feel like we shot up to 40 really quickly mm -hmm. um, and then it seems to have hit a lull. And I know you've stated a couple of issues, obviously a lack of housing, some early exit issues, were those issues not present at, at the beginning stages or, or what's going on there um, that might be contributing to that? I want to make sure that uh, not only that we start off strong, that we continue forward at, at, a, at a steady rate. Sure. No, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the focus, the continued focus on housing. And you were right. We did shoot out of the gate. But I can speculate what that is, um, but I want to emphasize to council that it's speculation because the role of the navigation center, right, once our outreach partners, whether it's PD or Flood or whoever brings them to us, our role is to get them into the system, get them into coordinated entry, get all the documents ready, um, lobby for them, get them placed in the housing match meetings. And then once they're matched, it really is the housing provider that kind of takes it from there and, and we support them as best we can. So the more appropriate answer, uh, the more I think the more detailed and accurate answer for that is going to come from those housing providers with whom they, um, they have been matched. Um, I will say starting off, it's not unusual to have a, sh a, a, a quick burst and then forward to lull, just be 
just simply be, you know, because it's new. Um, I don't know what was going on at the time in terms of funding and what the availability was. There might have been some special circumstances. Um, it may also be, which is not uncommon, especially when you start up a new shelter, I don't like these metaphors because it feels a little dehumanizing, but you s maybe start with some of your lowest hanging fruit, right? Some of, you know, some, of, some of your easier cases, folks that are maybe more appealing to local landlords to get them, you know, to get them housed first. And then as you then delve into folks with the higher acuity levels, the people that are gonna be a little bit more difficult to place, you then begin to level off in terms of the, accel uh, in terms of the acceleration. Um, those would be some of my guess guesses. Uh, I would also argue that in this community, as well as most communities in which we work, there simply is not enough housing stock. And what we are, and what I would expect there to be, unfortunately, um, are some longer lags in terms of getting, uh, getting folks housed. I will say though, um, our numbers though, in terms of known exits, the numbers of people that are getting housed or placed or moved on is exceptionally high. It is exceeding national averages. I, th I think we are all doing quite well on that. And I think the system is performing, uh, performing well. And if I may just really quickly, I think council member to your questions, our next presentation will have some data points that are relevant to that question. Fantastic, thank you. Anything else? Council member Aris, anything further? Thank you, council member Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation today and to the work that your whole team is doing. Um, it's really exciting and encouraging to see, and I'm very proud of our city as a whole for taking this step um, uh, I, I want to thank you also for keeping an eye on the, um, the concern related to those who cannot perform their ADLs and ensuring that we, we address that. That's, um, that's an important issue of mine. Um, to that end, I wonder if there are specific subpopulations of people that for whatever reason we, we cannot house and, and, and if you can identify that for the city so that we can begin working on strategies along with our partners. Uh, to find emergency shelter uh, solutions for those folks. Absolutely, let me start, and Theo, if you'll fill in some of my gaps here. I, I, want, I think it's important, I appreciate the opportunity to address this. Please know, Council, in terms of serving or not serving those who, who can or cannot perform their ADLs, this is not a decision, this Mercy, the Mercy House agency and the Mercy House staff is not reluctant to do that. We are willing to do that, we are willing to serve anyone. The problem is, is that if you have somebody who can't perform that, you open yourself up, and we would therefore then also open up the city to an extraordinary amount of exposure and liability. Sure. And we literally, we can't get insured for this, right? So we couldn't do that even if we wanted to, and we want to. And so therefore, uh, given the nature of folks, can you use the restroom yourself? Do you need help getting out of bed? Do you need help being lifted down into a toilet? Do you need help with um, showers? Do you need help with dressing? Some of these sorts of things. The entities, the industry that, that, that can do that and get the appropriate liability insurance for that is going to have more of a medical base than Mercy House does or, or any shelter. So please know that's the reason that we're not doing it. It's not that we don't want to get our hands dirty. It's, 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 it's just, it, it's just it would be wildly irresponsible for us to, to open ourselves up to that level of exposure and to open up our, our partner as well. Um, so typically, um, um, Councilmember Gonzalez, what we're talking about are folks that are struggling with those types uh, of activities. Those are generally the reason. I want to also make it clear who, who are not denied. We're not afraid of taking folks in with uh, serious mental illnesses. That's not a problem for us. Somebody with an active uh, substance addiction, that's not a problem for us. We will, work, we will work with difficult cases. It is strictly with these medically based conditions that exposes us to an extreme liability risk that we just simply can't do. Um, have I missed? Uh, no, I think you summarized it perfectly. Thank you. And the other thing I want to bring up is that you know I'm very proud of the fact that for the first time last year through BLNC and through the M Street Navigation Center, um, our community has been able to provide emergency shelter for single adult women, mm -hmm. and that hasn't been the case before. And um, that was always an alarming thing that has haunted many of us. Um, what, what is the capacity right now at the shelter for single adult women? Oh, for single adult women? 44. And, uh, what's the occupancy of those beds? 44. Yeah, we're full. We're, we're completely full. Yes. So what is the plan to build out that capacity for adult women who are unsheltered at this time? I, well, we're, the entire shelter is full right now, so we are open to any sort of expansion that the city is interested in. I would really honestly I would defer to city staff in your direction on whatever you want us to do. 
uh, we're, we're, willing, we're willing to do. I, I'm so sorry, I don't know how else to answer that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Councilman Gonzalez, we are prepared to immediately add an additional 20 beds, 10 in the women's dorm, 10 in the men's dorm. We can do that without building any further capacity as far as staffing or, um, or, 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 or resources. But we're also in the process of preparing a proposal for the city manager, uh, Mr. Clegg, that I assume he will present to all of you to increase capacity by as many as 150 beds. And uh, more, informa more information regarding that will be forthcoming in the, in the weeks. Great, ahead. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Councilmember Freeman. Just following up on that, uh, and I've had conversations with uh, Mr. Clegg about this earlier, I, I want to be sure we include in our budget sufficient funds to add 150 beds. We spent $10 million, we bought a facility we knew could go to 300 or 450 from a physical standpoint, not a management, but uh, we can't afford to build another one of these. And as long as it's going well, we should not turn people away who are homeless after all we've been through. So I hope we'll have the funds, we include them in the budget. Obviously the council may have to approve things, but that we, uh, we have to maximize the usefulness of this facility. Everything <laughs> we talked about tonight was the biggest priority of the community was homelessness. And I don't wanna hear that we're turning people away because we didn't provide the funds to expand a shelter that's ready to expand. Councilmember, we are in full agreement. We look forward to taking uh, staff direction on this and expanding to whatever level council is supportive of. Um, this is not a Mercy House call, uh, we, but we are excited to support the, the council and support the city staff in any way that we can. We are absolutely open to, to expansion, but I really do believe that that should be driven by the city manager's office, not, not, not me here tonight. Off no, the, my, off my the comments were really yeah. to the city manager, the budgeting process we're going through now. Mr. Clegg, when the city opens on June 15th, how many beds will become available at that point? Uh, I'll, uh, this is a, Mayor, um, this is a very good question. We're still anticipating some additional guidance on congregate shelter facilities, but currently there are 168 beds system-wide. There are 15 to 20 for our facility, but an, a, another number of other beds in the other shelters in um, Bakersfield that, that will become available over time as COVID restrictions are eased. Those are beds that existed um, or have been created through our recent projects in this last year before the pandemic, but because of social distancing requirements, there was a reduction uh, of beds. So there are 168 beds system-wide that, that should become available as restrictions ease. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. And the mission also will be adding women's beds. Councilmember Arias. Yeah, I want to uh, first start by saying that uh, it, it is uh, very clear that we need additional beds throughout the city and the county. Um, that is a fact. Um, but before I uh, take any action uh, in doing that, I want to remind council, I want to remind the audience uh, that there was a promise made to the residents that I represent there in Ward 1. Uh, and, and before I get there, I do want to say that I appreciate the fact that I haven't gotten a single call from residents in that area That's great. saying that you guys are not being good partners. That's great. Not a single business has called me uh, complaining about uh, your guys' services and operations. So I want to thank you guys. That is a testament to the good work that you guys are doing, and I so appreciate that. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I want to make sure that we make good with the residents of Ward 1, uh, that we are following up with them. Uh, there were some promises that were made um, about some considerations of uh, potentially putting a police substation in the area, uh, making sure that we're making infrastructure improvements to the roads in the surrounding community. And so I think it's appropriate that we schedule something here in the near future um, before we move forward with expanding any sort of bed capacity um, have that discussion with the community, make sure that we're providing those updates on all of those different uh, services uh, as a city uh, and as partners in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Arias. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just one more comment. As we 
continue the conversation related to bed capacity and the number of beds that open up after um, you know, the COVID restrictions are lifted. Um, I think it's really important for us to understand uh, the different types of beds and, and for us to you know, differentiate between the different types because not all beds are the same, right? Some beds are low barrier beds, some are not. Some beds are specifically for individual uh, adult men, some are not. Some are ch you know, women and children beds, some are not. I mean, I can go on, but you get the idea. We, we need to get a better sense from this dais what beds are available for specific sub subtypes. I don't see any other requests to speak. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Thank you, Mr. Dews. Thank you, everybody. Madam City Clerk, the next item, please. Uh, we do need a motion to receive and file. Vice Mayor, please. Motion to receive and file. You have a motion. Would you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Weir. Yes. Councilmember Arias. Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Gray. <coughs> Aye. Councilmember Parlier. Aye. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. And now next item, please. Reports item 11B, quarterly homeless update part two, presentation by the executive director of the Bakersfield Homeless Regional Homeless Collaborative. Mr. Clegg. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, as identified in the title, uh, Anna Lavin, Executive Director from um, the Regional Homeless Collaborative and Deb Johnson from our Governing Board are here to provide an update. Welcome. Thank you so much. We're really excited to be with all of you this evening and we likewise will try to follow in Larry's excellent footsteps and attempt to be informative and yet brief. Oh. Let's see if I can figure out how to use them. Oh, there we go. So um, tonight uh, we are presenting our quarterly update. I think some of the excellent questions that were asked a little while ago, we may be able to try to embed um, so that you can have a better sense of some of those systems pieces. I love those questions um, and we're really excited to hear some of them. So uh, essentially we'll be focusing on system performance measures. We've presented on these to you before, but I think some of them will be illuminating in terms of the housing, housing, housing that Mercy House kind of put an exclamation point after. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about um, one of our primary points of entry, that's our coordinated entry system via 211. Uh, the point in time count report uh, that we were able to conduct this year, um, as well as on the need for permanent supportive housing and our next steps. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm learning slowly here. There we go. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, the rest of the City Council. It is our pleasure to be here and hopefully we can kind of like wrap some stuff up like Anna had mentioned. So just to kind of like recap what we presented to you before when we talk about system performance measures, that is our data that is entered by our collaborative partners in our homeless management information system. That is where we gather the information for this presentation. So to recap, our vision is that homelessness is rare, brief, and non-reoccurring, and that system performance measures help evaluate progress towards our vision. So when we look at rare, what does rare mean? We talk about inflow. I think you're gonna see some interesting statistics on our inflow for um, our first quarter. Our outflow, there was a question uh, answer, or you guys had asked Mercy House about, like, you know, you guys were housing rapidly, and then it, it faltered, and hopefully we can answer some questions as we talk about outflow in our presentation, that it's brief. The length of time homeless needs to be taken into consideration as we talk about our shelters and where our housing is going from here, and that it's non-reoccurring means we really wanna focus on our recidivism rate, and that is the number of people that return to homelessness after two years of achieving permanent housing stability. Yes, please. So the inflow and outflow, real quick. So one of the, if you look um, at the far end of the graph, quarter one of 2021, which reflects January 1st to March 31st, you're gonna see we had a tremendous decrease in the inflow of homelessness. That is great news for our community. We saw a huge spike in the fourth quarter. We talked about that at our last presentation. 
but now we're seeing kind of a correction and a downturn in the number of people that are coming into our system. But as you look at outflow, our outflow is stagnant. Um, as you had mentioned, you know, oh, we were gangbusters, and we were gangbusters, and then the fourth quarter hit, and now we're into the first quarter, we're seeing that it's flatlining. So what does that mean? Why is our um, housing outflow um, declining or staying, staying stagnant? stagnant? Today I was on a call with Heather Kimmel, who's the Assistant Executive Director of the Housing Authority, and one of the things that they had mentioned is we talk about housing vouchers and case management, and we have an amazing system of care, but where the lack of housing is hurting us right now is that based on the information today, there's over 300 housing vouchers issued. That means 300 people are actively seeking housing in our community, and the housing inventory will not support that number. So we can talk about housing vouchers, we can talk about our case management, we can talk about all that, but at the end of the day, housing, housing, housing is key. Um, I read an article again today, it was in the Bakersfield, California, and I think it was back in April, 1% vacancy rate here. So when you're talking about homeless people or low-income people trying to access housing, they're in competition with people who are earning good jobs. They're in competition with the people that are getting the jobs at Amazon and stuff like that. So, you know, um, one of the landlords that article mentioned, as soon as somebody moves out, they bump up their, uh, their rent 25 to $50 a month per unit. That doesn't sound like a lot of people if you have a good income and stably housed, but for someone who doesn't have that and are dependent on a subsidy, that is a, a dramatic and tremendous impact on that family or that individual. The other thing um, with those housing vouchers, HUD is allowing us to increase the fair market rent that can be charged for that, but is that going to be enough? It still means there's a lot of competition for housing and there's still a lack of affordable housing. We already talked about the low vacancy rate and then the tremendous increase of rental prices. Um, we, we just looked at a one bedroom unit at like $895 a month. That is not affordable for somebody who relies on a subsidy or is extremely low income. So kind of like this makes sense. Our length of time homeless has increased. So back in the fourth quarter, it was 517 days, and now it's 570. So what you're seeing in this housing trend and the difficulty and why people are staying in the shelters and not getting moved into housing, it all, like, it, there's this common theme. All night long, from the first presentation to the end presentation, you're gonna hear from us, we need affordable housing. And that's, that's what ends homelessness, is housing. And I think uh, Larry puts it eloquently about the, you know, the goal of Mercy House and the Navigation Center is its first priority is housing, and when that's not available, then that's where our, our system kind of halts a little bit. Homelessness recidivism. Um, so that number, you know, has, has stayed pretty stagnant. So we do know that the people we are putting in housing with, with vouchers and wraparound services and case management, it's successful. We only have, uh, we actually decreased a little bit, so only 19% of the people we're putting in permanent supportive housing actually returns to homelessness after two years. And, you know, taking into consideration the pandemic and all the other issues we talked about, that is a very great statistic to be proud of. I'm going to turn it over to Anna for the next part of the presentation. So when we last presented, um, we talked about one of the major points of entry into, um, into our system of care uh, via 211, and that's phone calls into 211, and that's how uh, many folks, whether they're at risk for homelessness or currently experiencing homelessness or you know someone who's experiencing homelessness, this is where we direct folks to call. Um, so that way we can get them connected as quickly as possible. Now, what we did share with you when we last presented was that uh, <laughs> the fourth quarter of last year was hard. <laughs> it was very hard for our system. Um, you can see that there was a very dramatic increase, and I know that we shared that with you before. What is 
to some degree exciting for us is that there was a significant drop in the first quarter of this year in terms of number of calls into the system. Having said that, if you still look to a year ago, well before COVID, you can see that in some cases, depending on which month you're comparing to, we're still looking at nearly um, double the rate or at least 50% increase. Um, and so certainly that's an indicator for us that there continues to be um, a lot of need in our community. Uh, again, whether you're at risk of or experiencing homelessness. The other um, item that we wanted to talk about in terms of data is the point in time count. Um, there, there's a few items um, uh, that, uh, that I wanna mention on this. Uh, first is the point in time count for almost every other community in, in the state of California did not take place. Why? Because traditionally the point in time count for those who are unsheltered has been a face-to-face -face survey in the wee hours of the morning and I know that some of you have described participating in that process before. Uh, this year, um, the point in time count committee determined, um, and there was a lot of guidance coming out of a lot of different places that really indicated that when you're experiencing a surge in a worldwide pandemic, that that's not really a great time to get 400 plus volunteers together um, in order to interact with those experiencing homelessness. Uh, so I'm very proud of the work that we were able to engage in. Um, the question was, could we under undertake a point in time count in some other way? And um, through a, a variety of processes that I, that I sort of won't bore you with on the HMIS side, the Homeless Management Information System, uh, we were able to find that our system is robust enough uh, to allow us to actually conduct an unsheltered count using that system because we have um, amazing pro providers like CVAF, uh, Deb's here to re represent that, um, as well as uh, Flood Ministries and Clinica Sierra Vista who provide a uh, considerable amount of um, street outreach and medical um, street outreach as well. And so we were able to make a, a claim to HUD, um, the housing, uh, housing and Urban Development Department at the federal level. They're the ones who um, provide the guidance for us in terms of that uh, PIT is required and um, essentially made the case. Um, as far as I know, we are the only community in California who uh, engaged in a pit count using their HMIS system this year. So I'm very, very proud of that because we've been working very, very hard in our community under the last few years to be extraordinarily data forward and data focused. Um, with good data, we can make good decisions and help all of you and the rest of the community understand what's taking place in the community. Uh, Having said that, what I wanna make sure that we caution everyone um, is there is a strong um, inclination to wanna compare to prior year's numbers. And the caution there is that when you have a methodology change as in particular, uh, relatively different, I mean, we're talking about apples to oranges comparison. Um, so I caution uh, making any type of comparison. The reality is COVID's, COVID was a strange year, so this is, this is gonna just be uniqueness here. Um, the other point that I want to make mention when we look at this 2,150 individuals is that this is um, the number of individuals under a single night. And as one of the things I hope you take from this presentation and prior presentations that we provided is that we are, have a constant inflow of folks, whether they're at risk of, they've been taken over the brink, they are currently experiencing homelessness and a constant outflow of folks as well. Um, and I think probably you would take that from uh, Mercy House's presentation also. And so what we really wanna do is figure out over across a year, if we're looking at an inflow of 2,000 to 2,500 newly homeless folks, how do we address that uh, from a resource perspective on a regular basis? You know, um, I think to some of your points, uh, do we have enough beds uh, to regularly process or support folks in their journey to finding a permanent housing solution? And then of course, do we have enough housing inventory? Do we have enough vouchers? Do we have enough case management on this end to support the success of someone landing in, uh, and ultimately finding a permanent housing solution? So uh, one of the big differences though that um, you will see here is that the number of unsheltered um, looks like it's about 75%. Um, 
and the number of sheltered is about 25% or so. Uh, and to um, the city manager's point, uh, we had a number of beds that were reduced over the last year as a result of uh, required social distancing. We expect or would anticipate that uh, next year, no matter how we engage the point in time count, um, that the ratio of sheltered to unsheltered um, will be a little bit closer and not quite as drastic of an appearance. I think that's it. Okay. okay, so permanent supportive housing. Again, we're gonna talk about it still yet again. So we did identify in the fourth quarter of 2020 that there were 790 people in the HMIS system that qualify for permanent supportive housing. So remember that permanent supportive housing is three components, vouchers, housing units, and case management. Permanent housing is just moving someone out of a shelter into their own housing without any sort of case management or supportive services behind it or any other sort of subsidy. So we know that those three things need to come together to be super successful. So one of the things that, like, as Anna and I are trying to navigate, you know, 2020, going into 2021, all of these state and federal dollars that have come into our community, how do we leverage them? How do we make the, the most of them for um, housing programs and projects moving forward? So one of the things that's actually happening in the end of this month is that initial state money through the HEAT program, which is Homeless Emergency Assistance Program, actually ends. So um, a pot of money that we received about three years ago, that is ending. So what that means now is, okay, now we've got projects that have been funded through the state funding. That grant has actually, um, is through the United Way um, as our fiscal agent prior to BKRHC coming in. So that funding stream is ending. So now what do we do to try to keep the momentum going? So now we're looking at HAP and some of the other funding streams and how we can leverage all of our local, state, and federal dollars to keep projects going that started pre-COVID because this heat money came into our community before COVID even hit. So we, we tried to be innovative with some of our funding, and I just wanted to highlight one little small project that we started um, in March. It's called the CARP program. It's COVID at risk. Um, uh, project. And I think you remember uh, probably a couple of presentations ago, we talked to you about there's over 250 people that were medically vulnerable and that we had put on a COVID at risk list, meaning they had medical conditions that it, should they contract COVID that there would be a negative outcome. So one of the things that we did is we were able to um, uh, take some funding through the, the Homeless Collaborative. We just partnered with um, DHS with some funding and housing vouchers with the Housing Authority and developed a project, this CART project, that is to focus on 40 of those highest, most risk individuals on that by name list, match them to housing vouchers and get them into permanent supportive housing. California Veterans Assistance Foundation is taking the lead on that case management service. Um, even though we're stepping outside of our, you know, we're, we've traditionally been a veteran um, uh, only agency, we're no longer that. So if you hear of CVAF, we've branched into homeless youth and now this other population. Um, and what's really interesting and in that we've learned just in the first couple months of that, you know, we thought this is going to be an easy stand up project. You know, we, we, have, we have those three things in line, right? We have the vouchers, we have the housing units, and we have the case management. However, we are trying to work with an 80 year old unsheltered female in Ridgecrest. It's time intensive. The work that this project is going to do is so worth it and so valuable. And having an opportunity to use some unrestricted money and streamline a project and build something out of that is invaluable to the work and the subpopulations. Um, earlier in a presentation, you had talked to Larry about like, what are we gonna do with our medically vulnerable people? Or um, I think Andre, it was you that had talked about that. Give us an opportunity, the Homeless Collaborative, bring Anna and I to the table and our partners and let's talk about those populations and how we can be innovative and strategize for a different type of housing model that's non-traditional, 
um, and let's see how that can work for our community. I think we're gonna find as we focus in on these very specific populations, we're gonna be successful. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm, I'm excited to be part of just this small project that's spearheading something new in our community. Okay. Um, so there are, there is going to be money coming in. You guys are probably more aware of all of this funding stream than we are. So real briefly, you know, probably more for the audience, $12 million of the home ARP funding. You know, if we look at $80,000 to $400,000 a unit in development costs, that will bring 30 to 150 units online. So when you originally look at $12 million, that sounds like a lot of money, but when you break it down to housing units and our need, it's just scratching the surface. On the voucher piece, the Housing Authority just received 229 vouchers awarded by HUD. Just had a call on that project today, which is going to be the, uh, what did I, the EVE project, the Emergency Housing Voucher Program. Um, and that is to try to get 229 individuals matched in four months. That is gonna be a feat in and of itself. We have community partners that are going to be online on Friday having a discussion, how can we work together to stand up this new, again, innovative project. Um, and then the great part, and it's new, it's never happened before, these vouchers that are coming from HUD, those 229 have case management services or supportive services attached. That's kind of unheard of, and that's pretty amazing. The only challenge to that, and that's one of the things I wanna to bring to your attention is, we know based on preliminary numbers, we can fund case management for two years. We need case management for three. So we already right now see a gap of one year of case management services for those vouchers. Um, but a lot of things can happen between now and then. So as we uh, present to you in the future, you might hear us talk a little bit about needing case management services. And Mayor Go, I know you are a proponent of supportive services for this population. Um, again, now I'm gonna turn it back to Anna in our closing. So the um, BKRHC is the continuum of care has a lot of next steps. Um, so one of the questions was really how do we whittle down for purposes of this presentation in our quarterly report. Um, but before I talk a little bit about the housing piece, which is really kind of the emphasis of this particular presentation, I did wanna, not so much necessarily for the city council members, but for the audience, um, you know, one of the best strategies in helping folks uh, who are experiencing homelessness achieve permanent housing solutions is to help them have a sense of dignity and respect in our community and a sense of hope. Um, because without those things, it makes it very difficult to ensure that there's a sense of motivation or a will or a belief that even they are deserving of housing. Um, and so we really wanted to remind um, folks in our community that uh, wherever possible, please try to think about, and, and in particular, I'm thinking about social media posts that I've certainly have been seeing recently. Um, try to think about whether or not you actually wanna post that picture. Is it dignifying to this other human, um, to this other person, this other per neighbor in our community? Um, or is it causing a sense of shame? Um, there's a tremendous amount of research that indicates that folks who are experiencing shame that shame gets in the way of them finding housing. And um, to Mercy House's point, and I think our point as well, housing really is the solution for those who are experiencing homelessness. So let's do everything we can to help them feel supported. Um, the kinds of transformations that I know Mercy House and all of our other providers can describe is tremendous. It, it, it is truly a transformation, and it's really beautiful to be able to see. Um, but it makes it a lot harder if somebody feels a, a strong sense of shame and, um, and they don't have a sense of um, motivation um, to be able to move towards um, uh, finding a permanent housing opportunity. Other next steps, of course, include uh, we're working very closely with the city and the county um, staff in particular to talk through um, the home ARP funds that are coming through. Um, we do have those 12 million, uh, as, as Deb pointed out, um, we will, of course, always gratefully 
um, try to create additional units, um, but there's always more to do. And so our hope is that we can work collaboratively and work together in trying to think through how do we accelerate housing development given um, the numbers uh, that are really needed to try to help stem this flow and make sure that we are creating the amount of resources that folks like Mercy House really need in order for them to be ultimately successful in serving um, the groups that they're trying to, to work with. Um, in addition, in particular, I think many of us are aware of uh, unique groups who need something called permanent supportive housing. So in other words, they need care. Um, they need supportive services um, to find stability. And uh, the folks who are oftentimes the most disrupt disruptive in our community, uh, the, the folks who may be causing a lot of consternation for our community, um, these are the folks who actually do quite well when they are housed um, in a permanent supportive housing model. And um, we really appreciate the level or the, uh, the amount that they are able to stay in that housing. Um, but we can't do it unless we have those three pieces that Deb emphasized. Um, so let me go ahead and pass it back to Deb. I know she had a few final thoughts and then um, we'll be open to any questions. So right now I'm turning my hat as the governing board chair. I'm really proud of the work that our committee has been able to do to continue to have high participation in our monthly meetings. You know, we have between 40 and 45 people on these monthly calls. Now that um, we're gonna be opening back up, hopefully we'll get to see people in person. But some, of, I just wanted to talk about four key developments we were able to accomplish in the last year. The first one is we saw through the pit count and our numbers that we needed to focus on rural outreach. We have done that effort, so there has been huge strides since about March 1st to combine um, our agency is doing outreach to focus in the rural areas. We uh, supported a vaccination clinic out in the Mojave area today um, and stuff like that. And so it's not only working in the collaborative, but with community partners. That was a partnership with Adventist for that. Um, the second one is the development of a racial equity committee focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion in our housing and even in the work and in our governing board. So we're really fo focused forward on that. We have some amazing members of our community that have stepped up into leadership roles to have difficult conversations about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we can make sure that we're representing those populations in the work that we do. Um, the third thing is a healthcare and homelessness pilot initiative through Built for Zero. Anna and I have been on several meetings with a lot of the local hospitals to focus on medical, um, respite, um, recuperative care. How do we work that into the homeless system? Who's responsible? Where does the funding come from? How do we house that? So as we get a little bit further in the prop process, you'll probably see us coming to you for support on and maybe some ideas of how we can stand up a recuperative or respite care project in our community for those exiting hospitals that need that extra level of support. And then the fourth thing um, is we have a lived experience homeless youth. Her name is Janessa Fisher. What a rock star. She is now a uh, governing board member. So we've always wanted to have a lived experience person on our governing board, but to have that lived experience youth piece because you, know, you guys had a tough night tonight. You had a lot of things that you heard. But there were many things that crossed every part of the conversation. Homeless youth was a conversation. Housing was a conversation. Supportive services, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, all of that. And it kind of like, it's all wrapping up now into the work that the Homeless Collaborative is, is doing. We're keeping an eye on it. We want you to know that um, and understand how hard this committee is working to represent our community. Um, and, and have a great continuum of care. And that's the end of my comments. Thank you, Ms. Levin, Ms. Johnson. We very much appreciate the work that you're doing. You made a point about the need for ongoing funding and the big city mayors have been advocating with our governor, with our state legislatures for this. We know that the investment in HAP and HEAP cannot go wasted. We need that ongoing support along with case management. And then you made the point about the housing vouchers. Uh, the 
you, the mayors and CEOs for U.S. housing investment have been advocating for that on the federal level, reached out to the congressman also on that. I want to thank Anthony Valdez in the back who's been uh, providing legislative support with uh, big city mayors and also with the mayors and CEOs for U.S. housing investment. But your cry for additional support uh, is not going unheard and will continue to advocate on the state and national level for that. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be quick. At least I'll try. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation tonight. Thank you for your leadership. Thank the committee, please, on our behalf for all the great work that's been happening, especially during the pandemic. I want to particularly lift up my appreciation for all of the metrics and for you bringing this data to us every time you report and being consistent with that. I think that's a great uh, way for us to measure and track progress. Um, towards that end, you know, I think the recidivism rate is really interesting. And as you talk about the need for um, uh, more case management services, I think that's an important indicator to, to keep an eye on for this council. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a point well made but can't be made enough that it's not just about affordable housing or permanent housing. You also have to have those wraparound services and supports for people. And uh, I, I appreciate you continuously reminding us of that. Um, the last thing I will say, oh, I just wanted to also just give a shout out to Nina Carter and Anthony Valdez as well for representing the city so well with, with these efforts. Um, last thing I'll say is um, I think as we move forward, uh, perhaps not any, any time soon, but as we, you know, we have more affordable housing units online, it, it will be interesting for me to look at how our uh, metrics compare with similar uh, regions, other COCs, and how they're performing. Uh, so we can get a better sense of, you know, are we outperforming folks? Um, my sense is we're doing a, a heck of a job, but it would but be helpful for me to turn around and talk to the public to say, look, this is how we compare. So if we can do that uh, in future presentations, I'd appreciate it. If you don't mind me just mentioning, uh, addressing that last point. Sure. Um, the state actually has just activated HDIS, which is the homeless database information system, something along those lines, don't quote me. But in any case, it, we are uploading our information or downloading one of those two. Our information is going up to the state level as is every other COC in California. Um, and we, right now we have um, sort of private access, if you will, to that. I believe um, as, uh, since this is very, very new, um, that site, and being able to pull a lot of that um, will go live to the public. Mm -hmm. um, so we will happily try to bring that back to this um, can, you know, group if you're interested, or I can share with you the link. Um, if you are really excited about data uh, and you know, can certainly explore, we'd be happy to do that with you because uh, we're very interested to see some of that information as well. Um, it is new, um, so I know that there's some kinks that are still getting worked out, but um, we're really excited about that piece. Good. Thanks again. I don't see any other requests from council members, so uh, Vice Mayor. Motion to receive and file. You have a motion. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Weir. Yes. Council Member Arias. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Gray. Yes. Council Member Parlier. motion is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. And if you wouldn't mind just staying around, I think we're almost finished, but I, I just wanted to talk to you about a, something. All right, uh, next item, please, Madam Clerk. Council and Mayor's statements. Thank you. Council Member Parlier. Thank you, Mayor. So we continue to hear from our residents about illegal street racing and sideshows. Our BPD has come up with some innovative solutions to deter that activity, but we also need to prosecute those individuals that are putting on roadway incidents, interfering with bystanders and putting people at risk. Today, I'm asking the city manager's office to author a letter of support for assembly member Fong's AB3. AB3 works to curb illegal street racing by increasing prosecution for individuals participating in motor vehicle exhibitions of speed through things like sideshows and other dangerous stunts. That's it, Mayor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Parlier.
Colleagues, any other requests to speak? Thank you. This Monday was Memorial Day and we were privileged to be able to honor our fallen. Thank you so much to all the families of the fallen and to all of those who have served. And so tonight, in honor of our heroes who have served our country and who have given the ultimate sacrifice, uh, we adjourn the meeting at 8.30. Thank you. Welcome to the special meeting of the Bakersfield City Council. Now speaking, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to call to order the 430 special city council meeting of June 2nd, 2021. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Weir. Here. Councilmember Arias. Councilmember Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Smith. I'm here. Councilmember Freeman. Here. Councilmember Gray. Here. And Councilmember Parlier. Is Councilmember Parlier on yet? No. Okay. On March 4th, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency in California due to the threat of COVID-19. The governor also passed several executive orders, including the suspension of some components of the Brown Act related to meetings like this one. Therefore, seating in the chamber is limited. This meeting has limited public access. Therefore, public comments were encouraged to be made to the city clerk through email or by phone call. If you're here in person to make a public statement, please fill out a speaker card and give it to the city clerk. All statements are given a three minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk who will give them to the council. We're very interested and concerned with your issues. However, due to the public notice requirement of the Brown Act, council can't take action when an item isn't on the agenda. The council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts a meeting, such as repetitive statements, going off topic, shouting, or surpassing the three-minute time limit. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers? No public speaker cards have been received. Thank you. Next item, please. Under closed session, item 4A, public employee performance evaluation for the city manager. Thank you. Vice Mayor. I move we adjourn to closed session. We're adjourned to closed session. Uh, Mayor Go, I would just like the record to reflect that Council Member Arias showed up. So now we have six. Thank you very much. May the record reflect that Council Member Arias is here. Reconvening the 430 Special City Council meeting. Vice Mayor. City Manager's evaluation has been completed. 
Thank you, Vice Mayor. And with that, we are adjourned at 514. And we'll start the next meeting shortly.